Okay, well, we'll um, open the meeting formally now, and I want to thank everybody for, for coming, and um, also I think thank everybody for doing the best within the um, relatively tight quarters here. I suppose this works well, given this is so much of a working session today and tomorrow with respect to workshop selection, so we're all nice and cozy. Um, the f the um, first item of business is adoption of the agenda. Before I go to that, though, I'd like to just, again, introduce the um, individuals that are here um, with me. Wai Min Kwok, representative of UNDESA, is on the end to my left. Chengatai Masango, who, of course, you all know as the head of the IGF Secretariat. Victor Lagunas, who is the honorary host country chair of IGF 2016. And the head of unit, the CIO of the head of unit of innovation and strategy um, for the uh, in the office of the president for the Republic of Mexico. I was determined I was going to memorize that. <laughs> and um, Benedicto, Bened Ambassador Fonseca, Benedicto Fonseca, um, who is supporting me with outreach efforts in particular to um, governments and um, intergovernmental organizations, given my non-governmental background. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to move to adoption of the agenda. It's been circulated for some time. Today is fairly straightforward. Um, we're actually going to um, begin with um, some uh, additional comments from, from Victor as host country co-chair and then from the IGF secretariat. I think they both will be looking for some indication as to whether or not covering um, some points from their presentations yesterday would be helpful or if that is um, clear enough, we can certainly move forward to um, the uh, proposal evaluations themselves. Um, the second item will actually cover an overview of the workshop proposal evaluations, open forum um, sessions, and the um, other sessions as well. And that will sort of help us get the entire frame for the conference itself. And then, of course, we will move into the workshop um, selection activities itself, and that will take up, um, certainly hope, the bulk of the morning and all of the afternoon. And then tomorrow, um, we continue um, as necessary with the uh, workshop selection um, process, and we would um, dive a little, I'm looking for day three here. Yes, we'll dive more deeply into the main um, sessions and um, uh, the, um, any follow-up that's actually needed on the basis of all the intersessional work that we reviewed yesterday, so best practice forums, dynamic coalitions, um, national and regional IGF initiatives, and the connecting and enabling the next billion. And then finally, at the end of the day tomorrow, we have um, an, any other business slot um, where we hope to establish the uh, next meeting and the meeting dates. And actually, if we can, I think I'd like to share some proposals towards the end of the day so people have time to look through their calendars and we'll close on that tomorrow. So are there any comments or suggestions vis-a-vis -vis the agenda? Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much for the overview of the agenda. My comment is merely to make an announcement very quickly that in this room between 115 and 215, uh, the NRIs have a working session, so I just ask that everyone keep that in mind. It is a working session of the NRIs. It'll be open, but the primary purpose is their work. I just ask that everyone keep that in mind. So if we can um, just keep the schedule as much as possible, that would be very appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other comments or suggestions and nothing from the online participants, Anya, then I'd like to move for adoption of the agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, I thank you. So, Victor, I'll turn the floor over to you, and I, maybe there are some additional points you'd like to cover from yesterday or um, some questions. Uh, but I think um, the purpose of this session is to ensure we have sort of all the details we need with respect to um, the venue itself as it supports the workshop selection decision process. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, for all of for most of us were um, here yesterday, so just um, I'm going to go very quickly through uh, 
through the presentation, not taking too much of your time, um, and clarifying a couple of points that we, uh, we, we, we believe uh, need to be clarified. Um, so we're set to go. We're uh, in final, um, final preparations to, to, uh, to uh, secure the, kind of the, the format uh, of the event on the, on the venue itself. Um, you've seen the venue where um, we're working very hard to accommodate and to be very flexible around the use of the space. Um, and uh, we've met um, all of the requ requirements that Mr. Cheng et I has, uh, has um, kindly provided to us. So um, if you do have any comments or questions or feedback around the use of the venue itself, uh, let us know. So we can uh, we can accommodate that, and we can be um, we can be as flexible as we can. Um, regarding uh, day zero, um, I would like to um, to make a couple of uh, of, of clarifications. Um, we'll be uh, developing the day zero event um, on day zero, on the first day of of the week, um, as it's been used to on previous IGFs and in previous and uh, similar format uh, events. Uh, we're not changing or proposing changing that format. Um, on the same note, um, we're going to um, use that day to expand on and build upon and strengthen the IGF's agenda um, and, um, and really um, you know, proposing topics, panelists, and participants in a way that, that we believe strengthens uh, IGF as a whole. We, we are asking for contributions from the industry. That was, there, there were many comments yesterday, Don, and, and we kindly um, um, welcome them. That we, we are in no way changing the format of previous IGFs, the format of, of, of the sourcing of the funds. Neither are we proposing or expecting uh, to change the spirit into, the, into what the IGF uh, is meant to, to do and, and is doing. Um, so, um, but nonetheless, we've always been accepting uh, within IGF um, sources of, of support. Um, so we're, um, we're going to be building that format and we're going to make some changes as to how we communicate those. Um, the, if there are some other um, questions regarding those two topics, please feel free to come to us directly. We're completely open to talk to to any of you. I think it's in our best interest to move forward within this topic and for, for all of us to acknowledge that we're very open um, into discussing any and all of the, the, uh, the topics that we, can, uh, that we as host country are putting forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Victor. Um, I'd like to open it up for any further questions or, or clarifications. Again, it's important that we understand all we need to about the venue in order to support the um, workshop selection process. Juan, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Well, my name is Juan Fernandez. I represent Cuba government. Uh, I have a question for Lagunes and about uh, also the secretariat regarding the day zero events. Uh, in the last meeting, we agreed that uh, the Secretariat will have some uh, interaction in this selection. It, uh, how the selection of the events for the Day Zero is going to be carried out? Are they going to be announced uh, previously for all us to, to see what is in preparation for, for those days, for, for that day? Thank you. Uh, yes, we are going to share um, the Day Zero events but um, there's also s sometimes a confusion between um, what exactly is day zero when some people talk about day zero they're talking about the high level event and sometimes they're talking about the other events that are on day zero so those are um, so the high level event happens on day zero but it is not the day zero event as such and that's the thing that is um, hosted and controlled by the um, host country. The IGF Secretariat, of course, helps and coordinates with um, the host country. The other events, um, we usually do it on a first-come, first-served basis. We never have them full. Uh, we always um, stress that day zero is basically a testing day as such. So all the um, facilities may not necessarily work properly, but we do use 
that day to test and make sure that everything is okay for day one. Um, the events that are on day zero are mainly, mainly like the GigaNet, you know, the academic meetings, etc. Uh, day zero events are not quoted or referred to in the um, chairman summary, for an instance. So that's the difference between day zero events and the other events. But we will be sharing um, what's happening on day zero with the MAG. Yes. Mm -hmm. Juan, you have a follow-up? You have the floor. Okay. Yes, uh, of course. I know that the main event is uh, um, especially f from, from the HOT. I was uh, referring to this other event that you said that this was uh, done in first uh, ask, first serve. And I, I think that there should be some uh, selection process and some criteria because some of those events are more or less same as, as workshops in, in, the, in the concept. And, and, and it comes in, maybe it's not officially or on it, but it's also it's going to happen uh, during the same event. And uh, some of those organizations, even don't, they don't even have any consultative status on, on ECOSOC or whatsoever. So I think there should be at least some review in, in, in of those uh, little events that is going to happen in the first day in order to avoid any things that could be inappropriate for, for this event and it, it could uh, um, tarnish the, the you know, the, uh, the good um, happening uh, of this event. I could elaborate later on with you in the sideline in order not to, to get more time from, from this meeting. Thank you. I'm sure not. Yes, sir, and we can talk later and find out, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you for your comment uh, and questions, Juan. The, the surrounding events to, to, to the high-level ministerial on, on that happens on day zero, um, we, um, we're taking the leadership on, 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 that, on that specific day. Nonetheless, um, by, I mean, by saying so, we bear the responsibility um, and we welcome any, uh, any, any support and feedback from any of you. Um, by saying so, we would like to, to say that we, we believe we're gonna be strengthening the agenda itself. Um, I'm not gonna call it up for revision because in essence, what we're trying to propose here is to strengthen the, the agenda of, of, the, of, the, of the next days um, in a way that we also respect the next days. So Juan, you're very welcome to contribute. You're very welcome to be in the organizing com committee if you, if you can choose to do so. Um, but we definitely uh, acknowledge that, that by taking leadership, we also bear the responsibility of that of those events happening on, the, on, on, on day zero. Thank you, thank you, Victor. Um, we have participant number 2816 in the queue. Okay, if you could introduce yourself too, and then I'm sure we'll get the names noted. Sure, um, good morning everyone, Igor Ostrovsky. Um, I just had a quick question. I'm not, I wasn't here yesterday, so I apologize if this was already discussed, but um, we, um, we have had in the past IGS an opportunity to meet as uh, MAG, and, and I was wondering whether you're planning to organize um, a MAG meeting either on day zero or at the very last day to summarize the event. These events, I think, are very useful for us just to exchange ideas while we're there. My view on the MAG meeting is that it's very, very hectic throughout um, the week. And so having a MAG meeting where everybody is there and we actually have time to discuss things is a little bit difficult. Um, the last day may be a possibility, but then the last day everybody's leaving. There is, you know, um, so that's a little bit difficult. We didn't have one last year, but the previous years, I mean, it's, it's, it's up to you guys. We will make the time if you feel that it is necessary, but I personally feel that it's so hectic, especially on my part, that to, to get everybody there to actually have a discussion. Mm -hmm. I think the, the two options are either we try and find some time 
online, it's not even clear to me how many MAG members actually go to the IGF in any particular year. But at a minimum, I think we should schedule a follow-up call pretty quickly after the MAG um, for lessons learned and that sort of thing. So I think we should plan on sort of an extended two-hour call or something in the you know, week or two after the, the MAG meeting. But why don't we take that to the list if people feel strongly that we should try and organize a MAG meeting physically. Um, next, I have Liesl in the queue. Thanks, Chair, and good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the conversation about the day zero events, um, noting that we've always been very, ever since there's been day zero events, whether it's the high level meeting or others, we've always been very diligent, I think, to keep the day zero events related but discreet from the IGF. The, it's not the IGF that takes place on the day zero events. And while I think there's the, a general desire for um, any of the day zero events, whether they're quote unquote official because they take place in the venue um, or because they're hosted by the host country or anyone else that organizes one, um, I think there's a general desire that they all um, not tarnish, <laughs> shall we say, the, brand, the, the IGF or the, the notion of it. But I think we've always been very careful to make sure those aren't branded or named as IGF. Uh, events, and I think that is something that's an important distinction to retain. Um, and also, um, so I don't know that there can be the same kind of selection or um, or vetting or evaluation like we do for the workshops. Um, to to Juan's point, and I guess just if I might. Um, um, Forgive me, um, Victor, but press you a little bit for some of the um, I, I, further discussion or comments the, of what you have in mind for the Day Zero events. I mean, I, we spoke, you spoke uh, a lot about it last time we were here, and I don't know if there's, uh, or at the last MAG meeting, and I don't know if there's update on that as far as content or, uh, uh, or other plans that you might have that you can share with us in just a few minutes, if, if the chair permits. Thank you. No, I think that would be a, a useful discussion. Um, with respect to the Day Zero events, a call has gone out. It's posted on the website for the Day Zero events. And we certainly have expectations for how that process will work this year on the basis of past years. I think the one um, improvement I think we made to the process is that it was agreed um, by the host country chair and the secretariat that the proposals for events on Day Zero would be shared with the MAG. And I think that's in, in terms of ensuring that they're complementary and, you know, to my mind, obviously if there's a very strong concern on the MAG's part about some session, we should engage with the session organizers and I'm, I would expect that we could resolve it to everybody's satisfaction. Um, maybe we can see how that process works this year and suggest um, improvements for next year's process. But the, um, as I understand it, the day zero proposals actually come in quite late. You know, they, they, they're sort of a long tail for them. So. Um, perhaps we can make a standing item at our virtual MAG meetings to review the status of those as they come in and um, just sort of track that over the, the course of the next few months. And so, Victor, would you like to share some of your developing thoughts on the... Well, what I, what I can share right now is that we will be sharing <laughs> the, the proposal to... For the agenda, as, as soon as we are, as, as soon as we're ready to to, uh, to have that conversation, and it's going to happen very quickly, very soon, Basil. But, but thank you for your interest. I think one of the things that Victor has mentioned he's trying to do is ensure that the high-level ministerial event doesn't feel and look a lot like the opening ceremony with just a similar parade of speakers. And I think we could all really get behind <laughs> that as a as an improvement. Um, one thing also is uh, we, uh, we're focusing very much on, on regional, regional and national initiatives. So you, you will be seeing um, um, some of that happening on day zero. Um, we're, um, we're definitely inviting um, the, the region as to Central America and the, and the Caribbean to join the conversation. We believe uh, we, have a, we have a responsibility to do so on the region that has um, definitely a, 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 an eye on Mexico to, uh, to take leadership on, on many of those topics. Thank you, Victor. Um, next in the queue, we have participant 2842.
Yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Avritorio speaking. Uh, I have two, two, two things I wanted to mention. One is in terms of day zero events, I, I want us to be careful about bringing it into mag logic because very often it has been the place for us to discuss things that we weren't quite ready to, to put in a full blessed workshop or a full blessed main section, a place where not only are, is it technically testing out the waters of, of the place, but it's testing out the, the topics that are talked about and talking about some of the topics where the, the disagreement may still be a little bit more uh, visual, uh, visceral, not, not necessarily, but, but, but more apparent. So I want to be careful that we don't apply the whole mag logic to the day zero that we've applied to other things. And this is, I'm sure this is not in the intent, but in terms of the, the event that Victor, is, the Mexican uh, government is organizing, and I don't quite understand the balance between speakers and, and, and paying for seats and such, but I just want to make sure that if there is anything like that, that civil society that can't pay for seats still has seats. Thanks. Th thank you very much for that comment. Um, the, the quick answer is yes, of course. The, um, I think we, uh, we, we definitely acknowledge that, you know, the, 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 the perception really of those, of what we, we set out on that phrase of, you know, having the seats themselves. I think the industry understand, understands it better. They're used to um, engaging many events in such a way. And our interest there was to really develop, uh, a, you know, a difference for the ask of support that we're getting from the industry already. Um, our priority, as I mentioned many a time, is to have a very well-balanced event. Uh, and in doing so, we, we've actually taken a step back as to even um, how, we, how we fund it as government. Um, I mentioned it yesterday. It's not because we actually have the money to fund it at all, because we don't. Um, but it gives us the opportunity to really engage in those conversations with the different stakeholders and ask for their support because it, we believe in our, in our core, that it should be done in such a way. Um, but um, to, to be very clear, the voices will be there. We will be heard as many uh, as, as, you know, with the stake that we have. Um, I, I'm used to saying that if I take my hat of the current official that I am today, I am civil society, and we, are, we all are. So I have the same concerns. I bear the same uh, responsibilities. And I would like those concerns to be addressed in, 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 in a similar way. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to make another quick administrative announcement, I think. Um, everybody's filling in seats in the middle, and I can appreciate how awkward it is to have your back to a significant portion of the room. So you should feel free to find any other seat that works, works for you, and we will adjust um, the name plates. <laughs> um, and then I also want to make sure, because I don't have a, a great line of sight with Anya, who's managing the online participant queue. I think probably the best thing, Anya, is if you get a request from an online That's participant, Skype. Skype or just press your button to speak. Um, for those that aren't in the room, we're actually using a highly automated queuing system, so it automatically recognizes who was the next in the queue and, and what that particular order is. And that would be the fairest way to ensure that they were uh, online participants are inserted into the queue appropriately. Having said that, if Chengatai and Anya can figure out a better system, I'm all for it. I just want to make sure that there's a, a, a really clear, strong route for um, online participants to be heard. Um, so with that, we have Marilyn Cade in the queue. Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. My name is Marilyn Cade. I'm a member of the uh, business community. Um, I'd like to make a couple of comments, first of all, by thanking um, our host for the work that they're doing. I'm uh, very excited about um, how well things are progressing. I'm also very excited about the op new and unique opportunities that uh, this IGF uh, presents. And I'll just make a couple of comments. I mentioned yesterday, and the reason I take the floor is to mention, yesterday I mentioned that the NRIs might ask for a day zero event of 90 minutes to do 
an admin management discussion. So that might put them into the day zero lineup. I hope everyone would think that was in keeping with uh, our interest. Um, I'm also working on a separate um, possible day zero event. I have a lot of faith in the secretariat and in the host, and I think I agree with Aubrey that rather than bringing day zero directly into the mag, let's just ask for an update and a briefing and then be able to better understand whether there are core principles that we feel very strongly uh, shadow into the IGF and deal with it in that way. But try to be as open and inclusive uh, and maintain the uh, perspective that the Secretariat and the host country have as much investment in a positive uh, outcome of the um, Day Zero event and a reflection into the IGF as all of us do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm hoping we can wrap up the Day Zero comments quite quickly and move on to some other parts of the session. Um, having said that, I have Cheryl Miller in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I definitely wanted to thank the host country for bringing such an in in innovative approach to Day Zero. Um, and I know historically Day Zero has been a day for the host country to kind of shape and mold. And so I do agree with Avri's comments about um, keeping the mag logic out of that, although that's the first time I've heard that uh, phrase, so I'm, it scares me a little bit. Um, but I really look forward to seeing what um, the host country and the secretariat have put forward and definitely would appreciate updates. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Next is Sagoon in the queue. Sagoon, you have the floor. Uh, Thank you, uh, the chair. I just want to find out if um, there will be provision to still make an update on the national IGF initiative, maybe later in in the course of the, the meeting. Um, Sagoon, there's time on tomorrow's agenda to come back and okay. kind of revisit any kind of open questions or items on those. Okay. Um, but maybe we can touch base with you offline and understand a little bit more about the request. But there is okay. time on the agenda tomorrow. Okay. I think Thank Victor you. wanted a short remark before we go to Murad. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to uh, be very clear, the, when we talk about seats, just the, 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 and I hate the word, but um, it's not about the entrance to the event itself. The entrance to the event is open, similar format. We're just talking about the gala dinner, and that, that's, that's a little bit different. That's for the industry to, to acknowledge. The event itself, it's, it's an open event. It's, you'll, you'll have a full, full, um, full access to, the, to, the, to today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Murad, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Chair, and good morning to our Murad speaker. Uh, while understanding that uh, the high-level event is not part of day zero, but however, would you like to uh, update us on the preparation regarding the uh, high-level event? Uh, I mean, um, the, um, the level of participation, the uh, sending of invitations, um, the main topic which will be discussed there, and how you, uh, do you plan to, uh, to uh, attract the, uh, more participants from, um, I mean, at the level of ministers and the level of executives of, uh, from the private sector? Thank you. So as I mentioned, we will be sharing uh, the, the agenda we're building for day zero, um, and it's and we'll be expecting f um, uh, really feedback from 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 your end. Um, we we don't want to do this alone. We don't want to set the agenda by ourselves. Uh, really, uh, I really believe that we should build build it together. Yet, um, we we definitely have a, a, a um, an interest to to develop. Um, a re, a, like a regional approach and a national approach to, towards that. There's going to be many events happening. Um, many, uh, at, we believe, interesting speakers coming forward for different topics, and that's that's what we're going to be sharing um, as soon as possible. Thank you, Victor. I have. I'll go to the next um, individual in the queue who um, 
At this point in time, I'd like to make the last intervention and then ask the um, room whether or not one more trip through the actual facilities themselves and the setup of the conference rooms and would be helpful ahead of our deliberations. If you all feel you have a clear enough picture of that from yesterday's presentation, and I believe the presentation's online, um, then we can obviously skip that. But I'll just so you can think about it, I'll come back with a question in a moment as to whether or not that would be helpful. At the moment, I'd like to give the floor to Elizabeth. Everyone, um, since it's the first time I'm taking the mic, I wanted to uh, to say I'm I'm happy to be amongst all of you, and uh, and so far so good on the productive meeting. Thank you, Chair and uh, Secretariat, for facilitating that for all of us. Um, I also would like to thank the host country for the efforts that are going into the preparation. Um, it's been a it's been a long road that you've already accepted to do this and and have been moving this forward. And there's I know there's a lot of planning and hard work going on behind the, the scenes, so I'd, I'd like to thank you for that. Um, so I participate on the MAG t from the perspective of myself as an individual, but I also work for an organization, the International Chamber of Commerce, that represents the private sector across the globe. And so while I have members who come from large corporations who are able to fund um, sponsorship packages and things like that, I'm also um, a little bit concerned uh, from the perspective of my members who are small business people or people from wanting to engage in the, um, in the IGF and participate and, and be present and, and, um, and seen and recognized on an equal footing. Uh, and so I, I just wanted to share that not all of industry and business has the capacity to engage in the funding model. And so a lot of those people that um, aren't able to fund their seats would probably want to be able to access the seats as such in the same way that civil society and others would be able to. So I, I just wanted to share that perspective and, and speak a little bit for them because they're not necessarily in the room or able to, to do so. I also wanted to share the idea that um, the IGF isn't the same kind of event as other events around the issue of uh, industry funding or sponsorship. There's a, there's a concern, I think, if we, if we perceive it in the same way, um, that we're missing the idea that uh, we are working all together in a community-oriented fashion. And so I, I think it's worth having a deeper discussion, and, and we can do that through the course of, of the, the meeting um, with each other, and, and, and I think talk about the role of the different stakeholders and supporting and helping to make sure that the host country is able to do what it needs to do and um, isn't carrying the load alone and doesn't feel alone in that. But I just wanted to caution um, the idea that we might see this as an event like other events that can have branding of, of, of large players um, because the implications of that I think are, are, quite, are quite significant to the way the event would per be perceived, the inclusiveness with which all of the communities, but including other members from the business community, um, could, could participate and engage. So I'm, I'm really interested in having further dialogue and, and, and making sure that we can help and support um, your efforts and, and, and look at how we can do that. But I, I'd like to, to explore that within the unique and um, I think worthwhile uh, principles and understanding of what the, the IGF is as an event. And, and, and we, share, we share exactly your same, uh, your same concern, Elizabeth. And, and first, uh, let me, like I want to be thankful and I want to say thank you uh, uh, to you because you know, the way they, that, we, that you reached out to us uh, yesterday and, uh, and the conversation that we, we, we've been having so far. Um, we, we want to make it the most inclusive IGF. And that's, that's basically, we, we're burying that uh, very, uh, very close to, to our hearts, if, if I can say so that way. Um, so in, in, within Mexico, even the ecosystem is one of uh, many d diversities and many gaps. Um, so we're, we're reaching out and we're trying to bridge those gaps between uh, you know, either socioeconomic uh, size of businesses as well, gender gaps, and, and, 
and um, and accessibility really uh, um, di diversity the and we're developing each of those aspects as we speak um, we do not want to change the format we believe there's uh, an absolute value in maintaining um, the core spirit into how the IGF was created. Um, so in that, definitely, we acknowledge your, your, your feedback and also your input into the, the, the developing uh, days. Um, we, we are setting or we're sharing ideas. And also, we're new to IGF. And I said so on my first day. As I've attended three IGFs, and I'm, I'm co-chairing now. So it's very unfair to many of you because you've been here 10, 11 years and you're deep experts into what, what you're doing and the people that you represent um, and the companies that you represent and the organizations. So within that, we're very humble. On the other side, we do have, because we're uh, probably not that, that, that uh, knowledgeable, an opportunity to put forward certain ideas. And we defi definitely acknowledge and, 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 and are very open to this debate but we want this debate to happen here, and let's discuss it in an, in an open way, uh, in the way that basically you're, you're bringing it forward. Um, we're extremely open, and it's on our best interest to, to have this uh, discussion happen very quickly, so that we set out and we understand um, that the actions that we're taking are in the best interest of IGF as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. There are two more speakers um, in the queue, but I mean, I, I'd like to um, try and move on to another subject. I think this has been covered in full. Um, Changatai and I have had a number of meetings with Victor and Yolanda, and I am completely convinced that they understand the spirit of the IGF. And I actually appreciate the fact that they're exploring some new initiatives, such as how to improve the high-level ceremony and those sorts of things. I'm fully confident that we will um, come to all the necessary agreements and arrangements. Um, certainly appreciate all the, the comments, questions, concerns people have shared, and they should continue to do that. But I mean, I think at this point they've probably been covered fairly, fairly well, and we should try to move on. So I have um, uh, three people in the queue. Uh, Sala, Sala, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you, um, thank you, Victor for the clarification. Uh, yesterday when we were at the open consultation, uh, there was some uh, feedback from the floor uh, in relation to the sale of slots. And so that raised some concerns among several members of the MEG, but you've clarified that pretty much. Um, we're also speaking in my individual capacity. Uh, it's encouraging to see the, the immense effort that you're putting into the logistical preparations for Mexico. And uh, even during the discussions of some of the challenges of the funding of the IGF, uh, one, of the, one of the things that came up from uh, Sheeta, if you don't mind me mentioning your name, uh, when they had the uh, Indonesian IGF, they had similar challenges as well. And so this is perhaps something that the NRIs and um, I'd like to draw uh, the substantive coordinator, Marilyn Cade's attention to uh, you know, one of the challenges that potential host countries might face in terms of hosting future IGFs. And I know in previous uh, mailing list discussions, there was an email thread generated, initially generated by Wisdom Donkor, who's, who's not physically present, but is with us in spirit. And he mentioned early this morning that it might be useful to perhaps uh, look into, if not this year, Madam Chair, certainly something that the future MEG could look into, potentially creating uh, guidelines around the area, not hard guidelines, but soft guidelines, because we don't want to, um, we don't want to necessarily antagonize or to break the spirit of host countries, but essentially how can we help the proliferation of IGFs so that it's not only the rich countries who can host it, you know, but you can certainly move it across the uh, global landscape. So thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sala. I do hope we can start to move on to some additional topics soon, though. Um, Shivan, you have the floor. I 
I think it's because they're looking at your first name, which I'm sort of loath to pronounce, Lujuko, Jivan. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, just quickly, just like there are small NGOs and small businesses, they're small countries. So, you know, small countries also have, might have an issue of affording something that is uh, like that. So I, I think that we're all kind of clear that there is uh, uh, a, a great idea here brewing. And I think that this room is quite ready to contribute to a great idea. And I think that something that would be quite useful would be, for instance, a concept note, uh, like a one-page, two-page concept note of how exactly that could, so that we can all kind of contribute. And if we can, with our knowledge, perhaps by next week or something like that, next Friday, just an idea, something that could center the discussion. Thank you, Jivan. Uh, UNESCO, Shenhan, you're in the queue. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I also like to thank Victor for this interesting and useful uh, presentation. Uh, you know, actually, UNESCO is sending a very large delegation to Mexico, headed by our Assistant Director General. And also, we are getting our field office colleagues involved to attend the event. Uh, I'm concerned if that uh, the, the facility of uh, interpretation will be provided for also Spanish, because uh, well, imagine there will be many local participants from the region. So we like to know if the how many language will be uh, translated on the ground uh, in the event thank you I think that's actually a question for the secretariat so maybe Chengatai can or Anya Chengatai's stepping to a mic or running around the room to a mic <laughs> The, the question was about um, interpretation. Uh, specifically, would Spanish be available, but what is the, the um, plan for interpretation at the IGF? So at the IGF, um, only the main room has got the uh, six languages. Uh, well, it's, uh, six languages are required. Um, the host government may want to put in Portuguese or whatever, it's up to them, but the six UN languages are required. And then there's also another room where there's um, three interpretation booths, but then these booths um, are at the request of any workshop organizers that might want to have another language there, and, but then the workshop organizer is responsible for um, hiring the interpreters, and they can do that through the host country. Do you have a follow-up question to UNESCO? Mike, please. Uh, uh, Tai, thank you. Still, I'd like to confirm at the workshop room, it's all the, uh, in all the room, are uh, Spanish and English uh, available in the, for all the workshop? No, uh, the requirement is that only in the main room, okay. there is the six UN languages. Yes. And then in one other room, there's three booths, but then all the other rooms, the requirement is that um, it's just the floor language. If there's any additional, that's up to the host country, but usually no, because it's, the expense gets quite high. Uh, yes, I understand it's expensive to provide uh, uh, interpretation to all the room, but simply when we were uh, proposing workshops to the, to the IGF, we received some uh, required requests from the speakers and the participants. They, uh, they said that they only want to speak Spanish or they are only able to speak Spanish. Is that possible that uh, they can sit in on the panel? And so simply, I, I imagine there will be also many participants in the room from the region. They only understand the Spanish. So it seems quite, uh, I mean, uh, beneficial to, to provide if we can have this uh, resource to, to make the Spanish available in the room for all workshops. And then from my, my, my experience last year from uh, to the IGF in, uh, in, in Brazil, I thought that uh, sometimes the local language is very useful to help with the debates. Yes, um, I agree with you. I'm just telling you the... Um the standard requirements that we have. We have another room, but if for any additional requirements, uh, it's up to the host country. So the question goes to Victor. Um, but just to put, I mean, just for the main room alone, uh, for interpretation, it's $100,000. So, I mean, it kind of adds up just to g give you a um, kind of um, idea of the amounts involved, but it's really up to the host country about the other rooms. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Sala, you have the floor. In, I'm just wondering if uh, we have any sort of um, uh, you know, ratio or some sort of mathematical analysis in terms of uh, using the information that the host country gave yesterday. I noticed when you were presenting the rooms, room sizes, um, it had figures I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's something like 16 slash 24 slash 48. Now, do, do those numbers mean that depending on the type of session, those are the, the numbers that the room can actually take? or And then I have a follow-up after you answer. The, the small numbers that you saw were for the bilateral uh, rooms. Uh, we also had some figures around the, 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 the workshop groups, but they go on, on higher, and of course, depending on the, the topic, and it's up to, to this room to decide you know, where, where they should be hosted. From memory, I think there were two rooms that were between 150 and 300 people, depending on the setup, chapel and the cinema. And then there were eight rooms that could support between 70 and 100, again, depending on the setup. And that's, that's separate from the um, plenary hall or the main hall session. Sala? Testing. Thank you, Lynn. So just to follow up, it would be useful to see, um, like within the slot of, say, one hour, 45 minutes, or within two hours, how many rooms would be occupied and in terms of capacity, if those figures could be given to us in a table form, uh, that would be useful. In, in fact, we had them. We'll get to Chengatai's the Secretariat's presentation in a moment, and we both have um, a draft schedule that's been prepared by the Secretariat for review by the MAG, and um, in that information, it does actually indicate how many slots are available for which workshops at which time. So I think we'll go to that in, in um, just a moment. And maybe if there are any more questions on the venue, we can just leave Victor and Yolanda to answer specifically and or put up any of the schematics that might help. But um, I think there's probably enough information in front of us now to move to the next topic. Um, first, I have Avri and then Chengatai, if you can start to move through the overall presentation. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I'm actually asking. I, I was about venue that I wanted to ask something. One of the things that I don't understand, since we do have some flexibility, some, some workshops that require flexibility, is which of the rooms al uh, allow for the people inside the room to readjust chairs, to put them in circles. In other words, when they come into a room, a lot of workshops come into a room, and they want to deconstruct the nice little rows and, and, and make that. How many of the rooms will allow that kind of flexibility is the question that I had. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Avri. Um, reconfiguring the rooms is, um, well, I think the best thing to do is to wait until we see how many um, workshops there are uh, which require which certain type of configuration, and then we can build it to those specifications. But um, there's also some other issues with reconfiguring the rooms. First of all, we have the power running through um, the chairs, uh, underneath the chairs for the laptops, so it's a bit difficult for people to um, change the layout of the room. And then the second thing is the um, security and safety because um, there's quite some strict standards that, you know, after every five rows there should be a gap, etc. So, well, no, well, that, that's why I'm saying that if we know beforehand, then we, we, we can configure the rooms. Or if we know the, beforehand that in this room they want to start off um, in theater style and then go to a, a circle and then come back or something like that, then we can try and make some adjustments to, to that. But we have to know beforehand um, what's, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 28.50 participant has requested the floor. I'm not quite sure who that is. Oh, is that you, Anya, online? Yes, I, I think that's me. So uh, Ginger would like to speak. Ginger, you have the floor. Now, thank you very much. This is Ginger Park, Civil Society. 
Um, I I would like. I think it's very, very important that we go back to the intervention from UNESCO. So I personally don't feel that we address this adequately to appreciate it. And I understand the requirements. But I think it's very important that we note the comments that must have circled uh, about what really will be. I think that to not include Spanish translation in every workroom is backwards. If we're not even totally including the host country, now, Spanish is also a very, very important language, probably the premier language in the world right now, and that's another reason to include it. Um, Spanish speakers dominate not only in Mexico, not only in South America, but in the world. So I think that we need to have uh, – uh, back to that, and I would ask that – could we just ask uh, Victor to – thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ginger. Um, I have to admit the, the sound was quite choppy, but I think we managed to hear most of it, and the transcribers did you know, quite, a, quite a good job of capturing it. So your point was that you feel it's very important to have Spanish translation in every one of the rooms, given the majority of the world's um, speaking population, and specifically asked Victor if he would address that. Um, and I assume she's pointing that towards you, Victor, um, given Chengatai's earlier responses about what the minimum expectations are. Um, from the UN. So this is clearly above and beyond the um, specs you were given before. No, thank you. Um, what we're doing um, as we speak is we're we understanding the the really the funding that we have, expanding into how many rooms can we actually have trans, uh, the the whole um, uh, translation facilities deployed. Um, so I'm, we're not ready today to 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 give you a solution or to answer the question fully, um, we will be ready, um, I guess, as, as very soon. Um, we do acknowledge that both English and Spanish, um, you know, should, should um, in essence, as a best practice, be in, in every room. Um, but, um, but the specific answer and the, uh, the clearest answer I'll be, re I'll be ready to, uh, to provide to you um, soon, uh, very soon. Thank you, Victor. Anya, is there another online participant? Virat, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, am I audible? We can hear you, Victor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. My first inter intervention, and this is um, Virat Bhatia, MAG member. Um, first, I just wanted to quickly uh, thank uh, the host for the excellent presentation yesterday and the work that has been done so far. Uh, I also want to say that we understand the particular difficulty we face currently for the honesty, and I think we can all work towards a solution that will be um, and we can move this process along. I just want to remind ourselves that all, most all IGFs important on not obligatory on any country to host an idea. So, uh, more specific, our main room, uh, we made a request that, uh, would, for most part, main room participants usually require a U size, uh, U shaped table, which has about a 10 to 15 seating on sides and about four or five in the front of the face of the U and a capacity about 500. 
So I wanted to check if uh, the main hall or the main room with the main session will be held uh, has the configuration to accommodate such an arrangement or is it different um, than what we've had in the previous IGFs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Virat. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking to Chengatai to confirm. The, the last question specifically um, was a, whether or not the main hall could support a U-shaped format similar to what we've done in past years. Just recalling, yes, but it's in the courtyard. Uh, the answer is yes. Chengatai <laughs> is just um, identifying, if, if people recall from yesterday, that in fact the main session is in a courtyard which will be covered, um, but there is um, flexibility there for the, for the structure. <laughs> um, there are three people in the queue now. Um, I'll take these three, then I'd really like to close the queue and move to Changatai's presentation, which will give some additional sort of contextual framing for the workshop proposals we've seen, the slots that are available, um, the overall scheduling grid, which I think is really important uh, before we look at the workshop evaluation. But I, I would like to, to move some of this forward. Um, so we have UNESCO. UNESCO, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, just uh, about the translation, I understand it's really, really costly to provide a simultaneous interpretation like we have here. But uh, one option we can consider is to have some uh, volunteer uh, students um, um, I'm from local university to help in the room with uh, translation when it's necessary. I, s I think we had a good practice in some previous IGF in a, in a country. Uh, it works. And uh, secondly, uh, I also want to ask if I missed it, that any security measures would be in place in the, in, the, in, the, in the town? Because we also received some concern from some speakers. They said that uh, they couldn't make it because they, they, are, they, are, they received some security concern that uh, it seems not uh, completely safe. So I wonder if uh, the organizer has put any particular measure to secure the security from the, I mean, from the, for the international guests as, um, as usual. Thank you. Victor, <clears throat> Victor, do you have a response? Um, we are, what we're working with uh, uh, is alongside our Foreign Affairs Ministry to ensure that uh, visa, visas are issued uh, promptly and that uh, there is a special treatment for all the guests that we're receiving into the country. More than seeing this as a security approach, we're seeing that as a diplomatic approach. So um, we're we're, uh, we're working very closely to, with, with that ministry to ensure that the visas get issued in time and there's no issues around that. I think the issue is also rather there are any precautions in the city or the village itself. <clears throat> we're, we'll be working uh, this, the, within the, the UN security um, has a foothold on the venue itself and then the state and, and municipality level um, um, uh, enfor enforcement has responsibility to the surrounded area. Um, but it's gonna be monitoring uh, more, than, more than securing or, 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 um, or building another wall around the event. Um, so really it's, uh, it's UN security detail, the ones that, are, that will be um, um, ensuring and protecting the venue itself. Just to add on to that, I mean, um, in every single place we've been to, yes, um, we do have the venue, but there's also increased security patrols um, within the city itself and where the um, participants are, you know, by the hotels and etc. I Let me leave it at that. I mean, there's increased awareness. And just as long as you also, you know, don't go down a dark alley and etc. I mean, it's fairly safe. I mean, I've been there. I, I didn't see anything that worried me. I didn't hear any gunshots or anything like that. It's, you know. <laughs> if so, you might have thought you were in LA. Yeah. I just like to always bring perspective Sorry. back to these questions of security and safety. Um, 
We have um, online participant in the queue, and maybe we could also ask them to change 2850 to online. And then um, Victor and Yolanda, there were some requests, as I understand it, to take another um, quick look at the actual room, possible configurations and layouts from the presentation you showed yesterday. So perhaps we can get that, that queued up. So Anya? Yes, Ginger would like to follow up on her question. Uh, yes, we'll come back on you then if there's a problem. The, 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 the connection really isn't very good. There's a lot of um, interference. So, I mean, well, it's always better to hear people's voices. If they could perhaps type their question in as well, then we can at least make sure we get the full essence of the, of the comment. Um, Jack, you have the floor. Let's press anything. Okay. Uh, this is Ginger. Hello, Ginger, go ahead. I would like to follow up uh, with the host country, first of all, the, and thank you, UNESCO, for coming from Venezuela. I do know that they lost me. I do have a question, however, on language available in the rooms. I suggest it be an album of Spanish speakers should consider that the language to be spoken should be Spanish. Thank you very much. Ginger, I'm very, very sorry, but I'm not sure we heard your comment well enough. Um, could you type it to make sure that it's actually captured fully? And we can ask Anya to, to read it out here. Anya? All right, I'm going to read uh, Ginger's comment. Uh, thank you very much for addressing my point. Coming from Venezuela, I do understand that these things are more complex and difficult than they often appear. However, if only one language is possible, please consider whether it should be Spanish, not English. Thank, thank you, Ginger. Madam Chair. So within all the workshops, there will be uh, three languages available. Um, so that's, that's as far as I, can, uh, as I can go today. But within all the workshop uh, rooms, there will be three languages. I was punching, right? Yes, you made me happy no, 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 but, but surprised. <laughs> I was very happy. I, was no, very I, th happy I think the fair answer, way to say it is everybody's uh, happy within, but somewhat surprised. Uh, within, all, within all the workshop uh, rooms, there will be three languages available. Um, so. Thank you, Victor. Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Marilyn Cade. I just wanted to make a quick comment for those who uh, ask questions about security. Um, I have done two uh, industry events with WITSA in Guadalajara, both of which brought CEOs from major corporations and ministers. And the um, security situation was absolutely fine, and the national government as well as the federal government was uh, really excellent to work with. And some of the corporate CEOs have corporate security officers. They were the pain to work with, but all worked out well. Thank you, Marilyn. Bianca, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, echo on the UNESCO reps uh, point on like, you know, having youth there. And I also wanted to clarify whether there will be a youth IGF, like the one last year, uh, that goes congruent with the uh, Mexico Global IGF. Um, yes, we're engaging fully with, uh, with our younger generation. We're building the program as, as we speak. Um, so, so far, we're actually inviting a lot of, uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, volunteers, but we're engaging in local universities and national level universities uh, to be able to bring them, bring them closer to us and to the conversation. Um, so that, that, that in itself, I think, will make a very valuable, uh, more valuable IGF. Um, and on top of, of Marlene's comment, and I apologize, 
living in my country, and, and I've been away for so many years, but living in my country, you lose a sensitivity as to the security issues that, that you know, we hear, and, and, and some of them are true. Um, some of them are only heard outside because we usually just, um, um, you know, news uh, usually travels faster if it's bad news. Um, so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't worry about it. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, we have full support from the state level, federal level, and, and, and local uh, authorities. We have response teams. We'll, we're, we're used to organizing this type uh, of events and this level of events. Uh, we just hosted the OECD uh, uh, Ministerial uh, Digital Economy meeting in Cancun uh, and, and, so, and so on. Um, so in essence, we're not relaxed. We will be deploying fully. We'll, you'll have all full support of the local uh, authorities. Uh, nonetheless, I do urge you to, of course, um, as Cheng Yutai say, do not go into that dark alley because then um, you know, we won't be able to, uh, to really ensure um, what could happen. Um, the, the area and the neighborhood are quite open. They're open to the public. I mean, you'll be walking to your hotels. Of course, it's not a, it's not a, a neighborhood that will be you know, blocks and blocks uh, secured. So um, you'll see that you'll be part of the city, which we, we, we will feel very proud for you to enjoy even you know, the local restaurants and the, lo and the vicinity. Um, so within that, you'll, you'll see more security detail um, on the area um, itself. Thank you, Victor. Jack, you have the floor. Thanks, Lynn. Um, sorry to go back to the organizing of the main, main session room. Um, one of the things that we found out last year was really the flexibility of the room is quite important. So more than just the U-shape, if you wanted to have a more participatory main session, where the main session is not just a series of talking heads sitting in a U-shape, um, then some flexibility of moving the chairs and thinking through how this could be possible would be very useful. So that's one. Um, and secondly, I think the IGF is also like an important space, as we've seen in many previous IGFs, um, for, um, I guess, local communities to raise their concerns and issues. And um, I would like to ask a question or maybe like, um, uh, I guess, as, uh, maybe we can think about how IGF can provide an opportunity for protesters to kind of raise their concerns at the event itself. Um, in a peaceful way, so that it doesn't become sort of, you know, disruptive or, or, or dealt with in too disproportionate a way as we, as we have experienced also before. Um, and perhaps this could be a, a, a slot at the closing session, but that could be something that we could think through because it's, um, it's really, um, uh, and I think the openness of the host country would be quite important to ensure that this could, um, something that could be um, materialized. Um, I fully understand the request or the desire for flexible rooms, but um, it's also a balance, as I said. Um, if you want flexibility, then you won't have power and, you know, things like that. So, <laughs> you know, you know electrical, electrical power. power. And so it, it, it is a balance. And then also the cameras are there. I mean, I mean it's, it, it's, it's a lot of things to set up and the webcasting, etc. cetera. So um, it, it is a balance, but I'm sure, I mean... Um, the, the, the host country will work towards that, and, and of course, the IGF secretariat. Um, <coughs> sorry, what was your second point? Yes, I mean, so um, spontaneous protests are not allowed because, I mean, it, it is an event, the UN security is there. If they see something happening that they don't know about, of course, they will react because they never know where it will end. So if there's going to be any type of protest, they should come to the Secretariat and state that they want to do something, and then we can discuss and see maybe there's a little area or something, but um, there's a very, very low tolerance for, you know, protests as such, because you never know which way they're going. If some people start doing something that the security are not aware of, their primary role is the security of the um, part participants, and they never know what's going to happen. Mm. So, can you give Jack the mic, please? Thanks. So given that spontaneity is something that's a little bit, like, you know, wary about, if we can plan it, I think that will be really good. If we can say, like, the closing session, let's have, like, you know, this particular period, if you have issues that you might want to raise, this would be a space that might be possible then. <laughs> 
yes, I'm not, I'm not ruling it out. But, uh, but then again, this is my view, is saying that people protest if they're not allowed to voice their opinions. Now, I have a feeling that, I mean, this is my view, which I hope is shared by everybody else, is that at the IGF meeting, everybody has a chance to have their say, correct? But this is a conversation we can have offline. Um, but yes, that's my thing. Can I pitch in? Um, IGF in Mexico, it's giving us the opportunity to actually address many, many topics. And we've been doing so al already with, the, with, uh, with, I would call them um, special interest groups or different interest groups. Or, um, and I, I, I shared uh, you know, their, their concerns. Um, in essence, part of what we want to do even at day zero is to have that conversation closer. But we're not, uh, we believe we're not waiting for that event to happen to engage in, for example, freedom of, freedom of speech conversations, privacy conversations, and other human rights concerns um, that are deeply rooted into what we believe is kind of a highest priority agenda in, within the country. Um, but we're engaging those conversations as we speak, you know, to, um, to have that... Um, um, as a, as a goal within the, uh, within the IGF. That's what we call strengthening kind of the IGF conversation in the country and in the region. Um, so um, that, that it's already happening. And uh, we've already engaged with many groups within the country um, that uh, we were in many ways um, confrontational, if I can call it that, or we didn't, we, we didn't have, we were not sitting at the same table which we are right now, and we're deeply uh, grateful for that. Um, on the other hand, I think there was a mention yesterday around having um, someone call it uh, on, on conference, I believe, or some, there was a keyword that, um, that I may actually propose to call it open mic sessions, and we could definitely uh, um, build, build that into agenda so we can have um, um, an open mic um, session within, within the MAG if you deem appropriate. Thank you, Victor. And Benedict, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there anything you want to share from any learnings or experiences? Thank you. I was just thinking that I should also comment in regard to the uh, demonstrations, because in Jean Pessoa there were some uh, instances in which there were some spontaneous <laughs> demonstrations, as you have said. And in in the context of the meetings of the plenary, the UN uh, security, they have protocols, and they have to apply those protocols in a way that takes into account not only the need to ensure the freedom of expression, but also the security of the event. Because as chang I said, once something unravels in that, uh, you don't know what can happen. So there are protocols that can must be applied. Nonetheless, uh, we work together, Brazil, uh, the Brazilian government, together with the Brazilian Steering Committee and the UN staff, together with those who demonstrated. And I think there was a solution that was found that was appropriate. I think at the end, everyone was satisfied. I think the basic thing is to make sure that all participants are aware of those rules of, of engagement and also that any unexpected situation that can emerge can, uh, can be dealt with in the best spirit uh, with uh, very good will. We counted on the part of the UN uh, staff, the, the best of wills. Uh, also, there was some very reasonable uh, uh, reaction on the part of demonstration. So we think there, those things, there are protocols, there are rules to be followed, but I think uh, working in a very good spirit and cooperation, we can solve anything that can emerge in that regard. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I think that was a very, uh, very good conversation. Um, the the slides are up behind you. I don't think there are any behind me. Um, maybe we can just walk through again um, uh, the the layout, the venue, some of the slides, so that people have a, a refreshed idea, and then we'll move to. Um, the next topic. I'm not sure if Yolanda or Victor will speak to them, but. I'm just going to go very quickly into the main venue um, accommodations formats. Everything follows uh, UN rules. So basically, uh, Outside the venue will be the, the village area. And that's basically secured by local security. 
uh, gover uh, state government and municipal government security. Inside the venue is uh, the entire UN territory uh, complex. So everything inside uh, Instituto Cabañas is UN territory and follows uh, UN rules. Inside the Cabañas, we have a major patio just at the entrance. And in that patio, it's going to be the registration area. Oops. Okay. Oh, sorry for that. So as we uh, commented yesterday, we're going to make a, a note on how the registration could work to make sure that we commit with the UN rules of checking passport uh, against the baggage of every participant. The payview is big enough. We're going to make sure that we also uh, uh, recall on the recommendations of the MAC yesterday regarding having enough security arcs so we can have a lot of people flowing into the, the venue. Uh, all uh, totems for information will have the six uh, le uh, UN official languages and the Braille. We have a lot of signs on the floor so people can find their way in into the different workshops and, and bilateral rooms. The conference area is the major patio. We have the layout that the UN requires. In that patio is also going to be the main meeting room, which can allow 500 people at the max. We have all the bilateral areas, and bilateral um, rooms provide enough capacity. We have rooms uh, for bilateral meetings that can handle 39 people. Some other rooms can handle 47 uh, people. We can play with the, with the layout. I think Chengatai was clear on his point regarding that it has to do with power and to having all the connections ready so people can work during the meetings. And in the workshop areas, we have uh, different layout um, decisions to make. If we have an, a layout like this, we provide enough uh, space for people with disability, basically a, a wheelchair. If we want a different layout, we need to have less people because a round table requires more space and we still need to respect um, entrance facilities for people with disability. And in the major workshop areas, we have a capacity between 150 and 300, which is in the chapel and the, and the cinema. And within those spaces, we can definitely play with the accommodation. We just need to take into consideration that if we want a very different format, we need to schedule that so the agency can work at nine in changing the, the, the layout that the workshop may require. And remember that we have uh, 11 workshop rooms. So usually it's 10 and we have one that we can uh, use for different formats. And this is just an example. I mean, we're going to leave the presentation to the Secretariat if everyone want to take a look. And that's basically it. I don't know if you have any specific questions. Is that OK? Uh, th thank you, Yolanda. I'm hoping that that serves well enough that we can actually move to the next um, topic on the agenda, which was Chengatai is going to walk us through um, the overall grid um, that the Secretary is proposing, obviously based on past IGFs, a little bit about the number of workshop format slots and a little bit about um, some of the uh, statistical evaluation that um, the Secretary, specifically Eleonora, um, prepared yesterday. Um, so we'll turn the, the floor over to Chengatai, and then we'll come back to the workshop selection review process. Miguel, you have a, a question? Just a little clarification on the on conference format. This is something different as the open mic sessions, and I don't want this to be confused. Uh, this is a different format. Uh, they have their different uh, way of doing that. That's just a clarification. That's a good clarification. Thank you. Chengatai, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Okay, so um, I sent out this morning the um, files that Eleonora prepared. Um, so the first thing I would like us to look at is the um, PowerPoint. Um, it just has a breakdown of the statistics. Um, 
just because um, I think we are a little bit over time, so we have to um, rush a little bit. Um, this is basically the basis of how are we going to select the workshops. Um, <clears throat> if we start at um, slide number 11, please. Oh, sorry, let me just jump around. Um, yeah. Uh, slide number 11. Um, there's ways of s selecting the workshops. We can say, okay, by merit. If we select them by merit, we just take the top, and then we say, okay, those ones who scored the highest fit. But then, again, we have to make allowances for um, newcomers, developing countries, etc., who don't, who may not have um, as well-written proposals as um, the, the other people who are long timers in the in the uh, um, proposal game, and um, so we have to take that into consideration. The other thing as well is um, the number of topics, because I'm sure we all want a balanced um, IGF meeting um, with um, a fair range of topics to interest um, the, the greatest number of people. Um, so those are just some of the things that we have to take into consideration when selecting the workshops. Uh, usually in the past, we've taken a mixed approach. So one of the things that we can look at is either start with the top 60 and um, then select the rest uh, by uh, top 60 by merit and then select the rest just to fill in the gaps which we see are in the um, workshop selection process, whether or not we want to add more people from um, the technical community proposers or more people from developing countries or more first-time proposers. So these statistics, uh, we've um, made the dividing line, the top 60, the top 85, and the, all of them. So the first slide, which, is, um, which we're going to look at, is slide number 11. Yeah, slide number 11. Um, if you have it on your computer, this is just by the tags, how people self-identified um, what kind of um, theme or topic area that their workshop proposal um, falls under. And as we can see, for the top 60, top 85, and all, they more or less correspond um, in all three of the categories, except for human rights um, comes first in all, but um, in the top 85 and the top 60, it's access and diversity. And here we have the percentages. So basically, we have um, in red, the top, I think the top five, access and diversity, human rights, multi-stakeholder cooperation, freedom of expression online, and internet for ICTs for sustainable development. In the top 85, the bottom one is um, cybersecurity, um, comes up there. And um, overall, there's no cybersecurity in their overall one um, for the first five, but that's just an overview often. If we go to um, slide number 12, um, these are just the session types. Um, other is, of course, comes on top because it's an amalgamation of, of all the other types. We have um, in the top 60 debate panel, but in the overall, it's the breakout sessions. But panel comes um, number three here. So uh, that's one thing we can also uh, look at and compare. For slide number 13, which I think is the most important slide, it's just um, compared to based on whether or not it's developing or developing country. As we can see for the top 60, um, it's 60% from developing countries and 40% uh, from developing countries, which more or less aligns. I mean, for the top 85, it's 40-60, which is the same as the top 60. And for all, it's 54-46. Um, so in my view, that's not a great variation. So we can choose to make the um, cut either the top 60, top 85 um, to carry on. Um, for the first timers, um, there you see a, a little bit more of uh, variation because for overall, um, they, we have 43% of the overall proposals are from uh, first-time um, submitters, 
but for the top 60, it's 22, and for the top 85, it's 27%. Um, so whichever way we make our cut, we do have to make some allowance to um, include more first-time proposers uh, when we go through the workshop proposals. And then um, the comparative view as we're looking at from the stakeholder groups, um, I think it's more or less the same from the overall, uh, while if you compare the top 60 and the top 85, I think it's more or less balanced. 59% um, of the proposals came from civil society. That's in keeping with the current trade. And, and of course, I mean, civil society is the largest stakeholder group. Um, government, of course, is um, the smallest, so we may want to make allowances for government. And it's fairly... Um, standard for the um, intergovernmental organization it's five percent five percent and six percent and um, private sector it's 13 12 and 10 um, I beg your pardon sorry uh, I I'm almost finished yes almost finished I'm just going through very quickly um, then for the other slides, 14, 15, and 16, it's the standard deviation. I would actually defer to Mike, who loves this stuff better than I do. I'd lost it my quantitative methods long time ago. So if Mike can just um, say a few words about the, um, the well, you, you know what to say, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Shankadai, and thank you for doing all the extra calculation that is involved in doing the standard deviation. The reason I advocated for making that calculation two years ago was because we really want to get those proposals that are very controversial. And the very controversial topics may be the ones that don't get rated very well. If you can imagine a topic that half the people in the room just don't want to talk about and give they all give ones to that proposal, whereas the other half of the room is really excited about the topic and they give it five. And so by doing the standard deviation, we have a very non-biased, very effective way to quickly spot those proposals which may not have made the cut, except that a whole bunch of, it, of us thinks it's really important and the standard deviation flags that. Um, uh, when we did this in the past, it, it was useful. There were a couple of proposals that people got talking about and there were a few people who rose, took, uh, put up their hand and said, hey, this, this is really important and they explained why it was really important to the people who hadn't understood and hadn't uh, uh, realized why it was a new topic worth doing. So I, again, thank you for doing this uh, and I, I, I do also think that this exercise is one more reason why we don't want to just arbitrarily take the first 85 proposals because um, that doesn't leave much room for some of these more controversial topics or some of the topics which uh, may be of an interest to a niche community and a real interest to that community, but not to the overall audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, then there's two other um, files that I sent in the email. Um, one file was the... Um, the top 60, 85, and all, which has um, which has the tops, if you uh, which has the statistics in it, and then also if you go to the third tab, which is the overall evaluations. So um, these are rated by order, and you can sort them out um, by the average good grade, standard deviation, total grade, and also by whether or not it's a new proposer. Um, yeah, stakeholder group, et cetera. So we can use um, this file when we're going through the proposals. Uh, so the two cutoffs that you know, we are proposing um, is either on um, row number 61 or row number 86. 
Um, so that's one thing that we can look at. And then the other file is just a, um, a schedule, a, the schedule grid, um, which is just a proposed schedule grid, uh, which is IGF 2016 sample grid. For the workshops, it's, um, as we can see, there's different types of workshops. There's um, one po 90 minute workshops, there's one hour workshops, and there's 30 minute workshops. Now, if we just take it um, by the top 60 or top 85, and if you look at the bottom of the sheets there, um, I'm mainly looking at um, day four, but it's fine. I mean, you can look at any other sheets, it's the same information at the bottom. I get uh, 110 slots, and we can see that's 80, 1.5, um, oh, 80, 90 minute workshops, five one hour workshops, and um, 25, 30 minute workshops. We have, and then we have the open forums, which is um, 30 open forums. And um, we have the 11 dy dynamic collections, and then we also have the best practice forums, and uh, which are five of them, and the main sessions, which are seven. That is a total of 163 sessions in all. But for our workshops, we're dealing with um, roughly 110 slots. I say roughly because it depending on whether um, the timings are different. So we have to calculate that at the end. But it's roughly 110 slots. I will stop there for questions. So. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> sorry, one second. And Sala had had a small question she wanted to get in the queue, so we'll come uh, come to that in a moment, Sala. Um, <clears throat> what we've done the last couple of years is there's been a, a brief discussion with respect to where there should be some line drawn with respect to a reasonable expectation would be that the bulk of those proposals, the top 60 or the top 80, are taken into account because of the breadth and diversity of the reviews, et cetera. We do go back and look at them through an exception report, which is if, if um, some of the MAG members have questions or believe something um, is too redundant or inappropriate or the format doesn't really um, match the description, those sorts of things, we do um, review those. And there have been a couple of different processes, I think, used over the years to pull those out. Um, and then um, uh, past MAGs have actually looked at what are some of the um, other aspects of diversity that we want to ensure are reflected appropriately in the panel and identify if there are any concerns or shortfalls or sometimes perhaps over emphasis and look to adjust those as well. Um, there's, um, so I, th I think what we want is sort of general reactions at the moment in terms of is that a reasonable process? Um, if anybody has a better process, we're certainly up to it. That's the process that has um, sort of emerged over the last couple of years. It's, I have to admit it's not always the smoothest process because it's an awful, awful lot of material to go through. But um, I think we need to start with some base assumption that says we have to assume that these proposals are, um, are, are thoughtful, are well supported because of the number of reviewers, because of the high rankings and then find some other way to call out those that maybe some MAG members feel are exceptions. We, we can't start with a baseline of zero and expect to find, um, you get through a 100 workshop selection here. Um, so I put that out there for people to think about. We have Sala in the queue and then a few others. Sala, you have the floor. Testing. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend the Secretariat for putting up the statistics and also thank uh, the working group that dealt with the guidelines that helped make our work easier. And it wasn't easy, probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do. <laughs> Grading 200 and what, 274? 274 proposals, but by the time they got filtered, it was 260. Yes, um, one of the things, you know, I started off grading it one by one, and then I realized I was better off grading apples with apples. So I used the hashtag in terms of, I looked at all the privacy workshops and compared them to each other. And so when I suggested mergers, um, it was stemming from that. And I'd also like to take the time to acknowledge the incredible aggressive outreach done by one, because there were lots of Cuban proposals. 
<laughs> it was amazing. So there were some workshops. I, I would find that if, if you go through the guidelines, they'd get a low score because they would not meet the representation guideline. But however, they'd be new entrants. But in terms of the mergers, they'd be fantastic with other mergers. And so, this, yes, the scoring helps. But again, going back to what um, Mike mentioned, if you can imagine like a bell curve, if you imagine a bell curve where you have the fringes and you have the density that's sort of centered in between from, from, the, from the mean, from the average. And so as I began to compare the human rights proposals to each other or the gender proposals and that sort of thing, what I found was there were, there were uh, interlinkages to other sub-thematic categories that uh, may not necessarily fall within the, the, the epicenter, but would intersect with some other ones. And so, um, so this is just a thought, Chair. It might be useful to consider uh, having uh, maybe breakout groups where we could like, yes, take the standard deviations, but before we're quick to cut, to also look at ways where we, you know, we're not letting uh, new voices go, that might have low scores, but who might fit very well into mergers. Because there were lots of potential mergers. Thank you. And th thank you, Sala. Peter, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Peter Dengate Thrush. Just a question. Uh, when I was looking through them, I found that people had called their proposals a debate, and it wasn't a debate. Uh, and they'd given it a title that seemed to have nothing to do with the content and so forth. What I didn't look at was how accurate the tags were. And I wonder if anyone's had a look at that, because if we're going to start using the tags as a grading or classification or aggregation system, uh, I, I'm just a bit concerned. But if someone has looked at how accurately people have tagged their proposals, um, then, then I'll have more confidence in using, in using tagging as a sort of an aggregation method. So, has someone looked at that? And, and does somebody have a view about how accurate the tagging ha has been? Thanks. Sala, to that point specifically? I would say that um, whilst there's some tags that were accurate, there were additional tags that were on the fringes. So uh, I would say they'd probably be roughly 75% accuracy. Thank you, Sala. Marilyn, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Marilyn Cade speaking. I have several comments that are going to be of concern. I'm going to start out with the first one, which um, a few years ago I was part of an international organization where we had an elected officer who came to all the meetings, public meetings, but it turned out when the report card was published, uh, the participation in the conference calls, he had a 40 percent attendance and participation rate overall. The highest number of raiders is 44. There are, I think, 55 MAG members. This means that 11 MAG members, our job as MAG members is to do this work. And this means that we have a gap in fulfilling the work. I say that to look forward to future improvements in uh, making sure that MAG members do the work. Secondly, like Peter, there were many debates that were not debates. There were many panels that don't have background documents, and yet I look, and they're rated very high, some of them in the top 65. We agreed if you proposed a panel and didn't do a background paper, you're disqualified, or at least you're penalized. I have a strong objection to the fact that the people who did the work, and it's not fair to say I'm a newcomer, I didn't know I had to do a background paper. That was very clear. There are some other situations which, if you didn't open the background paper, you didn't notice that it wasn't a background paper. It was just a republication of the workshop description. That's not a background paper. So guys like all of you, we're all out trying to encourage submissions, but we're also responsible for being fair in the ratings. And if we rate 
people who proposed panels and didn't do the background and let them stay in the top category, I'm very concerned. I'm happy to move them to the category we debate about and let them, and I said in my comments, give them a week to submit a background paper. But I think it's unfair to the people who did the required work and particularly because we have limitations in the size of the, some of our, our, our time slots are gonna be 30 minutes. So that's generally the concerns I have. I do think we need to be careful about balance of some kind, rough balance. I don't think it's exactly the same number from each stakeholder group. Then the final comment I'm going to make is I can't comment on flexibility for government or IGO workshops when those same parties may have open forums. And I'd like to have the overview of the open forums and the topics before I support the idea that we adjust the number of workshops because overall we have a program. The program is the entire meal. And if I'm serving part of the dessert, I might not deserve to get to also make the salad. I'm so bad at sports analogies. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, thank you. Let me um, try and uh, see if there's support for one or two of the points that Marilyn um, just brought up before going back to the queue. Um, so m the first comment I'd like to bring up is Marilyn made the point that um, some of the sessions that were in fact really didn't fit the criteria um, for a submission. Is it worthwhile to take those um, proposals that didn't submit a background paper it sounds, it sounds like Marilyn has a list of those that didn't. Um, see what the room thinks about them, and we can certainly ask them to submit a background paper um, in a moment. But, I mean, to me, that's a matter of was it a strong criteria that people feel strongly about, and it ought to be one we uphold, and they're ruled out, and at the same time given a chance to come back in and, and supplement the paper, or do we um, show some flexibility and move forward? So if I can just get comments on that position. So I have Juan in the queue and then Mike Nelson in the queue. Juan, you have the floor. Raise your hand then so they can, there you are. Okay, uh, I'm sorry to disagree with Marilyn because we always agree almost 100%. But I, I think that uh, it, during the the virtual meetings, you know, the telephone meetings, I, I stress that it's very hard to uh, ask people from other languages to present descriptions of, of this uh, workshop, of, of this workshop. And to, on top of that, to ask them to do, to do the background paper, I think that we have to have flexibility with people that the original language is not English. Otherwise, we should accept them in some other languages. So I think that we should not put that as a go, no go criteria. I think that we have to do, exert our criteria in, in terms of the content of the workshop. The tags, as Peter said, is, is a good way because it, it's a guidance uh, to the content. But I think that we have to exert our, our criteria. Having said that, I don't think, uh, I, I only been in the MAG f this time and last time for your PESOA. Uh, and I think that this time we have gone a little bit backwards. Last time, our selection of the top 85 and top 60 was more balanced. I think this year we have uh, gone backwards in, in this. This means that this uh, numerical uh, grading only on the merit. I, 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 like, I don't like to use the word on merit. It's a numerical because uh, th that is not the same to see that is uh, because uh, I think that Michael explained what is the deviation or what that is. It's about the number that was given because that number can be given for, for many reasons. I think that merit de de deserves a discussion. Having said that, having said that, uh, uh, Chair Lady, I have a proposal that is the hard one because it means a lot of work for us. I think that we have to do maybe begin with, with a small selection that it has to take into account not only the, the grade, but also the, the standard deviation, and to select a group, maybe 40, that could be already in. And the rest, I think we have to take a closer look. In order, we have to, we have to 
balance not only the stakeholder that proposed, but also the topic. This is be being held in Latin America, in a developing country. It has their own uh, challenges and, and process that are going on. And uh, so we don't, I, 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 maybe I'm going to be now a little blunt, but there's many topics there that are only a, a concern in a first world country, in a, developing co in a developed country. All those things of internet of things and many things are very arcane for the three-fourths of, of, the, of the population of this earth. And on the other hand, this is the year that we, we're linking this with Millennium Developing Goal, with development. And, and, and so I think that we should be exert, uh, that, that's our role of, of the MAG, to put some sense on this. And, and, and may, maybe there are things that, that are very well uh, written and that, but are only for, for very developed countries, and even for the rich people in developed countries that can have all those uh, gadgets and things like that. And so we, we, I, I think that we should exert as a mag. I think this is the hard way, because I told that in, in, the, in, the, in the meetings, in the telephone, that this is always subjective. Of course, it's always subjective. So we have to argue on that. For instance, let me put an example. I, I was ethical enough not to vote for any of the Cuban submissions. Apparently, I had a very su uh, successful outreach in, in Cuba because there was a lot of, su of submission. Not, not the big amount that was there. That was a mistake. It was not 32. There were 18 submissions of workshop and two were re uh, retired by the, by the secretariat because it really, the, the topic was really not, not for that. But of the 16 left there, none are in the top 85. I know that in, I checked that this that the redaction, that the description is not very well done and all that, but uh, maybe it's not the moment, but I could argue, I, I didn't vote for any of them, but I, I could argue that, at, for instance, one of the, one that I think is the three of the last of the, of the po points average grading that it has of the whole list is one of the last. I, I can say, and, and excuse me because it's, I am defending a, a particular workshop from Cuba, I think this one is more, more of the relevance in, in, in all this internet governance forum, and not only this, but many internet governance forum. Because you know what it's about? Do you know that Cuba ha helped more than 100 countries in the work with medical uh, personnel that goes. It went to fight the Ebola. In, in, in Africa, it has in many Latin America, and it has a lot of doctors. Do you know that a way that the doctor used to help each other with diagnose, and that is through internet, with with infomed, with with a network internet, and that is there a medical collaboration, and it only took 2.29 points. Uh, Juan, thank you. I really appreciate your your enthusiasm. I, I th thank you, and I always appreciate your enthusiasm and, and passion. Um, what I heard specific to the question that I asked was for those um, panels that didn't submit background papers, should we pull them apart and look at them by exception? I would say from what you just said, your response to that was yes, because you said there are some exceptional circumstances where maybe English isn't their first language and they found that too difficult, but it's still a reasonable proposal. But I want to go to Michael, and then we'll come back to the queue. There's quite a long queue now. Just uh, very briefly, <clears throat> yesterday I started off by agreeing with everything Marilyn said in a particular intervention, uh, but not today. Um, first, uh, her, her criticism about some MAG members not rating, I think, is, is a, c a concern. But so some of the people who didn't rate are here not actually as, as more as liaisons to particular organizations and perhaps they didn't feel that it was their place to, to do it, I'm not sure. But the more important issue, the one that you're asking us about, is whether we should reject those panel proposals that did not have a background paper and I think the answer to that is, is simply no. Um, there were a whole bunch of proposals that clearly could have been a panel or could have been a, a, a a breakout session or could have been a debate and 
for whatever reason, and I think the reason was they didn't want to do a background paper, they chose another format. So I, I think it would be unfair and to, to just pick on those people who chose to put down a panel proposal without a background paper. I also think that for some cases, it was very easy for the proposer to put down a background paper that may have been something they published a year and a half ago about a topic that they've been working on for many years. That is a minimum amount of effort. There are people who put in very Im impressive brand new topics which they haven't explored for more than a couple months. And those people could not have pulled together a good background paper. Um, so we'd be punishing ourselves, I think, to uh, grade those in, uh, or to eliminate those, those proposals. I, I, I just think we should, again, look at the top 60, assume that those are well critiqued, well reviewed, um, and then work from there. Uh, I do think Juan has made a point. There are a number of interesting proposals that dealt with one particular project in Cuba. In many of those proposals, I suggested how they could be merged with some of the very impressive proposals that are in the top 60. Um, I, I also think it's important that we, by taking the top 60, we have, have a platform to build on. And as we look at the other proposals, we can look for places where we might be able to plug in panels or panelists to those 60. Um, it's very hard to do that if we're actually going to start and build from the very start and just assume that we haven't approved anything. I hope that's clear and I hope that's helpful. Now th thank you, Michael. Um, I'll go to the queue in a moment, but I do just want to correct one thing. In, in fact, there are 55 MAG members. The other liaisons that you mentioned, which I assume you're talking about some of the other international organizations, are not counted as the 55 MAG members. So um, still, though, the 44 that did review out of the 55, um, Shengatai said yesterday, was significantly higher than in past years. Um, and I, I know that um, Odessa actually looks at the participation, many different components of that of MAG members, and that's certainly taken into account um, with subsequent year renewals. So um, I just, just for, for clarity there. <laughs> um, let me, the next in the queue is, um, Aubrey Doria. Aubrey? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to sort of cover several of the things that people have spoken of, but also go back to some of the criteria. First of all, when I look at these, we have 40 some odd that got four or better. Uh, now, I think that we should pretty much trust the aggregate scores that we've gotten because I think a lot of us took these issues into account, whether it was deducting for absence of, of, of paper or for mislabeling a debate, a panel. Those things are pretty much already in the mix. I think to apply them now in any sort of hard and fast manner would be problematic because it's already in, in, in the waiting in, in a lot of things. I think that when I look at these, this almost seems to fall in a pattern of three. Well, we've got essentially a third that are above four. They can't have gotten a lot of deductions. They can't have a lot of, of standard deviation. Uh, because they're, they're clustered towards, towards the top there. And, and they seem the kinds of things to me that should pretty much be accepted unless someone has a strong objection to them. Then you look at another third group there and you start to see where, where there's a break. And you could say that these are ones that perhaps need to be dug into a little bit deeper. What, what were the issues? What was the standard variation? Where was the balance? And so on. And then you finally have the sort of lower uh, scored set where you really have to go looking for how do we use these to make the balance. But I think if we could sort of start dividing things, I'm very much against telling people that if you submit a paper now in two weeks, we'll give you a better score. Uh, I think that we should come out of this with deficiencies that we expect people to fix and certainly say, hey, you, you know, you scored really high on a panel, but your paper 
was not really panel quality and you really got to fix this. That kind of thing is good. But uh, so in terms of your specific question, I'm, I'm kind of saying no but, you know, or yes but. I'm not, I'm not sure which one comes first, but yeah, thanks. And thank you, Aubrey. That was very helpful. Um, I've got quite a list of speakers now, and I'll just go through a f few of them quickly so you know where you are in the queue. If people could, could um, speak specifically to the sort of process you want to move forward. We've got about uh, less than an hour left before the lunch break, and we need to leave this morning with that process agreed. I, I suspect it's going to require people to go back and look at their scores and figure out which ones they'd like to call out for exceptional or more detailed review here in the room. So I, I really think in terms of what we have in front of us, we need to agree the process before we break for, for lunch. So I'll just go through the next three or four quickly. There's about 10 in the queue. We have Julian, Jack, Cheryl, and Peter as the next four. So Julian, Julian, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going through all the um, uh, review of the proposals, I found that uh, it seems that uh, most of the proposers are not aware about the facilities for remote par participation. And in general, remote participation proposals lacks of a good strategy for that. So I think it's important to highlight to the proposers the resources that IGF offer for remote participation because most of the proposals are just based on social media, but not really on the, on the tools that we have uh, uh, on, on site. And uh, it will be very important to uh, increase uh, the participation, so probably to organize uh, some uh, online workshops um, for the, with the proposers uh, to, to, to enhance that, that will be important. I will mention also some um, issues regarding the evaluation process. Uh, I think it will be very important um, in the future to have uh, uh, some kind of filter of the proposal, proposals by sub-teams so they will be easier to uh, evaluate similar proposals for um, that are candidates to, to merge the proposals. Also, it was very difficult to um, evaluate gender balance because uh, we don't have uh, the, the gender uh, uh, specified in the participants of, of, of the workshops and will be very important uh, to have a gender specified so we can better uh, uh, rate uh, the, the, this kind of, um, um, of gender balance in the, in the proposals. And uh, also to clarify what the proposals come from. A lot of participants came from Afghanistan. I thought that Omar were doing a good job in, like Juan probably did in, in, in Cuba, but it was not the case. I mean, it's a lot of um, um, proposals that are not uh, linked to their countries. And... Um, um, also encourage proposals to include multi-stakeholders from different sectors and regions. There are proposals that are, are only for, uh, all the speakers are from the same country. And um, it's important then to uh, recommend to have uh, perhaps an online meeting for interest parties to prepare the proposals in, in, in advance so they will have more chance to be selected. As I said, highlighting remote participation tips and requirements from the IGF in order to have stronger proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Jack, you have the floor. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so I just wanted to say that I agree with Avri. I think we should accept the ones that got four and above and just sort of say, okay, this should be fine um, and accept that. And then for the middle basket to also include those that scored ranked really high in the standard deviation, I think that's a really interesting thing to actually put into the, into the, into the mix as well to look through like, you know, really po um, opposing points. And while thinking through the middle basket, some things to bear in mind. Um, in relation to the background paper, I think some of it is also very loosely defined, like some is mainly an iteration of the, of, the, of the workshop proposal itself and then PDF and then turn into a background paper. So I think that's also something to think, um, to bear into consideration. 
on top of all of the other very good points that's already been raised about first-time proposals and stuff and how difficult that might be or different periods of, um, of um, going through a particular thematic area. And um, also to raise that first-time proposers had quite a lot of challenges with the submission. I think there were like some technical glitches that was being raised um, in relation to the submission platform. And that you couldn't, for example, remove a name of a... Accidentally, re when you click on someone's name, you couldn't remove it. You had to do the whole thing all over again. And I think I also heard another feedback was that the name was not actually selected, but then it appeared in the final proposal, uh, in the final proposed workshop. So that could also explain why some names kept appearing all the time. Like, I, you know, there were really a few names that just kept appearing in every single workshop, which was a bit weird. Um, and that might have counted against some of the scoring as well. So maybe that should be um, borne into consideration. And then um, also to just re-emphasize the point that, we, that the criteria is, a, is a, I guess, is a basket of factors that we take into account, that sometimes you can't really adhere to it so strictly because what that would inevitably end up doing is privilege those who are very familiar with submitting IGF workshops and we want to also be guided by end objectives which is to promote diversity in participation, encourage newcomers, um, developing countries and diversity in stakeholder groups. So I think that can be very useful to help us just think through some of this. And finally to agree with Julian, I think um, for future proposals um, for the submission, it would be really great if you can have gender specified um, the same way that we do with stakeholder group as well as geographical location, to have that as one of the things that you need to kind of just put forward. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jack. Um, Cheryl, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also think right now that looking at those that have four and above, I think we can probably trust the scoring thus far and let those go through. For the middle ones, um, you know, I do think there's a lot to be said that there are some significant language barriers and there are barriers to, to entry if you're a first time proposer really not understanding and knowing. And so I think we should be a little bit flexible with respect to the fact that perhaps not everyone had a background paper where they should have. Um, I think if it is overall a, a good proposal and we think that it would really enrich and benefit uh, this IGF, then you know we should give that consideration. And so those would be my comments for moving forward. I know there's a long queue, so I'm, I'm sure we can come back to this maybe in terms of thinking about next year how we can do better and, and make sure that we get um, you know we kind of improve on what we've done. Thanks. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm going to come to Peter in a moment, but then the next four or five speakers are participant number 2840. I don't know if that's online or not. Xiaodong, Renata, and Laura. And then there's a few more after that. Peter, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Peter Dengate Thrush. Um, I think this is a really important topic, and I think we've got to be very careful about just coming to a quick, easy solution. This is actually quite hard, and we have to think it through quite carefully because a lot turns on it. And so my position is largely in support of the principles that Marilyn Cade put forward, uh, except perhaps as to remedy, and I'll come to that, Madam Chair, because you've asked for a process and I will finish with what I think we should do. But along the way, I think the first thing you've got to notice is you have to reward the behaviour that you wish to see repeated. If you ignore infringements and if you ignore people who don't follow your rules, then nothing good happens. They don't get better at it, you don't get better, and, and nobody has any respect for you, the process, or the institution. So uh, although I'm a lawyer and I tend to have a rule-based approach to many things, in this case, the reason why we have rules is so that we can create things, so that people know where they're going, so they can put energy and time into things, and then other people can benefit from it. So these are constructive, if you like, rules. These are not punitive rules that we create to try and punish people. These are rules that we create so that people know what to do so that we can have a good outcome. And if you don't follow those rules, then you don't have a good outcome. So, um, uh, sorry, let me just make sure I don't repeat myself. Um, I, I think in this case, these rules were very clear. I think it's been pub the, the there's a couple of publications in the process that said the Secretariat will go through and will eliminate people that don't comply and said what compliance was. And in relation to the background paper issue, there's a special page on the website that tells you not only must you put together a background paper, but what it has to consist of. So it's not a language issue, 
There's a whole set of criteria that a whole lot of people put time and energy into thinking about and publishing. And, and it's not good enough just to publish an ab abstract, and most people haven't done that. The rules say it has to have a title, it has to have a middle, it has to have a beginning, and, and so forth. And you can look it up on the website. Um, you've got to say why it's relevant. You've got to put time into showing why you've done this. And again, that's a constructive rule that we need so that we can help do evaluations and people can put in proper proposals, and not to do it, and then not to suffer any kind of a uh, penalty when you don't do it, it seems to me, uh, is backwards. People were clearly on notice, and a lot of people did do it and followed it through, and it's unfair that having done, done the work and complied with the rules, that they then uh, are treated the same as if they were, were disobedient. Um, I have a great deal of problem with one suggestion uh, that we should now change the selection criteria to develop, um, to favour uh, proposals that are good for developing countries. Um, while that might have been something that we could have decided, that's not the whole point of creating a theme and sub-themes and tags is for, uh, not now. Um, I want to add to the list of uh, omissions that I think should be punished, if you like, and that is the failure to do a report from a previous workshop. Um, that's a really serious, obvious point, and I think the Secretariat uh, really um, doesn't need any decision from us. The rules are quite clear. The rules say the Secretariat will eliminate from consideration anyone who has uh, done a proposal, uh, done a session before, and not done a report. Um, I, it's hard to think of a, of a clearer, sort of obvious point that if we ignore, we just make ourselves look completely foolish. Um, I don't think that saying that we've, and this is Avery's point, I think, I think there is some people, some people will have reacted subjectively to some of these omissions, but I don't think that's the point. These are, these are clear breaches of clear rules, and if we don't you know, do something, so you can't the other thing my experience tells me in this thing is it's very hard to creep up on discipline. It's very hard to slowly introduce and, and expect that you will slowly, you actually have to just start. You actually just have to start having your meetings on time if you want people to show up on time. You can't just say, look, it's not good enough, please turn up on time next time. You just start the meeting on time. And after a while, people realize that you mean what you say and they show up on time. And similarly with, you know, you have to publish a background paper if you don't publish one, your proposal won't go through. It's very hard to keep saying, well, look, we have these rules, we're going to enforce them, and then not enforce them. And this goes by a variety of names, sometimes tough love uh, is one of them in some areas. But you actually have to start discipline to actually get the benefits of discipline. Talking about discipline is actually not discipline at all. So what I suggest we do is we mark all these ones that don't comply with our rules, and we put them on hold. We go and we develop 80% of the program, and then we include them when we go back to do the diversity, gender, other balancing uh, process, because some of them will have contributions that we want to do. But we make it very clear that that's what's been done with them, and that only on this occasion will they get the secondary consideration, and then in the future, all of the rules will be applied strictly. Thanks. Well, so, so I think that was um, very well said, uh, you know, the last part specifically with respect to the remedy. And where I was trying to get to earlier when I said we note that there are exceptions and then we look at whether or not we allow them in exceptionally. Um, maybe there's, there's quite a long queue if, and I'm not quite sure what people were meant to talk to, but if people could just give me a quick reaction um, in your speaking comments as to whether or not you would support that again. So whether it's the top 40, the top 60, or the top 80, if some of those um, proposals have not met specific criteria, that they be flagged, be set aside for an exceptional review a bit later in the process. So I hope the ask is, is clear. And um, I'll take a few more comments and then see if we can get support from that in the room and then move on to some of the other subsequent steps. So 2840 is in the queue. Thank you. My name is Konstantin Kulikov. I'm from the Permanent Mission of Russian Federation. Uh, I have a question on MAG rating and selection process. I've noticed that the topics are pre-selected according to their popularity only. Will the final workshop agenda formed by the MAG also take into account regional balance apart from the thematical balance in order that some topics which are of utmost interest to some specific regions won't be totally discarded? As long as the IGF is under the auspices of the UN and our work here is all about leaving no one behind, 
I believe this criteria is also very important. I heard that certain members may find some topics of low importance, but in that case, it would be really great that aside from the hot topics, there should be at least some regional quota. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think we do try and assure diversity and a good regional balance as, as well um, in the workshop. Xiao Dong, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think thanks for the analysis. I think it's, it's very clear for us to figure out the issues which need to be improved in this year. I think it's most important for us is to work together to improve IGF and make sure IGF success in the next decade with big influence and comprehensive support by the stakeholders. But I still remember in last year in Geneva, when we select the proposals, I, I think it's lack of the participation from the technical committee, but I, I'm very happy now in this year, the proposals from the technical committee in the top uh, uh, 60 and also in the top 85 uh, is, is almost double than last year. That's very good. But the, the balance issue is still a big problem. If we look at the top 60s and also top 80s, the lack of the proposals from private sectors and the government or intergovernment organizations, totally only around 20%. I think it's a very small number. If we, if we prefer to in, improve the influence of IGF, I think it's exactly right for us, for we MAC members to consider to increase the proposals from rural stakeholders, to encourage them to join the IGF discussion and make contributions. So my suggestion, I have two points. One, if we treat government and uh, intergovernment into the same categories, I think we can allocate uh, maybe 14 or 15 for each stakeholder categories, and then we have another 25 additional proposals which not belong to any categories, and give the 25 proposals to the best proposals, I mean, by the ranks. And another uh, suggestion is uh, try to merge as much more proposals into the selected proposals, and to encourage more people to join the IGF. I think it says a lot of uh, first proposals is very good, but how to make sure that the, their proposed proposals were selected, all merged into the proposals selected uh, to encourage them to join IGF discussion. Thank you. Madam. Thank you, Zhao Dong. Can you just give me a short reply as to whether or not you would support the remedy that was put on the table before, which said, assuming there's a top 40, 60, 80 or so, that um, those proposals that didn't meet the criteria be set aside and looked at on an exceptional basis? Uh, I, I, I try to think about it, and I'll give a response soon later. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Renata, you're next in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Renata Aquino Ribeiro here from Brazil, uh, MAC member. Uh, I would like to address some of the observations before. Uh, first uh, question, are the slot numbers definitive or can be changed from the uh, spreadsheet of the evaluated, um, sorry, from the spreadsheet of uh, the sample grid? There were a few uh, numbers, slot numbers, workshops. 80 workshops one hour five yes they can be changed because um, depending on the timing if it's got more 60 minutes then we can have more if we have more 30 minutes then we have a lot more etc okay mm. that is good to know thank you Chengatai. Uh, because of some observations we can see that there are real issues that we should flag of the proposals that were um, approved for example the background paper standards some background papers were just description of panel routines is that acceptable as a background paper? Uh, speakers come in, five minutes, uh, presentations. That, to me, that uh, should be uh, a background paper that is not really acceptable. Uh, also, I'd like to readdress the issue of merging country and regional workshops and the importance. New proposals from Northeast Brazil also are not on the top 100, as it happened with Cuba. 
This brings up the suspicion that new proposers and new developing country regions are not getting the priorities they should. This point needs to be addressed by MAG members. Also, we should address the issue of reviewing who the offer is in the proposals, which shouldn't be a criteria. The usual suspects in, as IG voices has already been pointed out as an issue in IGF, yet we see them again in the selection list. Also, it should be noted that some proposals claiming to be from developing countries and new proposals were not from developing countries. So again, and new, propo new proposals. So again, this review is very necessary, as well as platform challenges from new proposers. The inclusion from speakers from developing countries should be noted. I was included in a, in a workshop as a proposed speaker, and I could not even check what the workshop was about, so I did not confirm. Afterwards, I found out that a name similar to mine had been confirmed. This is probably an error, so how do we address it? Uh, so mainly, I would like uh, to first take another look at excluded developing countries workshop. If you look at the stats of the top 60 proposals, 40% only are from developing countries. The IGF has as part of its main mission to include developing countries in the decisions about internet future. If this, this is exactly the audience being left out, what is there to go on with? Thank you, that concludes my intervention. Uh, thank, thank you, Renata. And I do think those are some other categories. I think we've had a, a few proposals which have commented that we should look at those proposals that are in the highest standard deviation um, for inclusion. Um, I think the same thing with respect to the new proposers and the developing country issue that you and, and Juan mentioned is another category that we should look at um, and potentially um, look to bring in. Laura, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the Secretariat for the analysis. It's been really helpful to um, see the grading broken down in this way. Um, I think in theory I agree with looking at the top 40 and accepting them, but I would strongly support uh, Peter's comments. Um, we can only judge as the MAG members, we can only judge the proposals on the information that we've been supplied with. We set the requirements um, that people needed to comply with for a reason, and I think it's unfair that um, people that haven't complied with these don't get penalised in some way. Um, I would strongly agree that there should be a severe penalty for a lack of providing a report for previous sessions. Um, it's a clear requirement, um, and I would think regardless of how dynamic or exciting the sessions were in person, if they haven't provided a report, then it means that that conversation dies straight after that IGF, and it's not accept accessible for anybody that was outside of that room. Um, just picking up on Xiaodong's comments on mergers, uh, there was a huge, huge number of proposals this year, um, and maybe we need to focus more on mergers than we have in previous years where we, had, we didn't have such space limitations. Um, there could be sort of similar process, uh, similar suggestions in that top 60 or top 40 that have quite a lot of overlap in them, and they cover maybe the same ground. So I think it would be really helpful if we could see a list um, I know when you went through the, the grading, you had to suggest mergers, so it would be helpful to see a list against each proposal with which topics, of, which other uh, suggestions had been, uh, which other workshop proposals were suggested for mergers, um, just so that we can have that in our minds as we're going through the proposals. Um, also, a number of people have spoken about grouping by themes, and I would support these comments. Um, I think it's important that we've, we've had quite a spread of thematic workshops, and I think that when you look at the breakdown by the top 60, that spread is not necessarily reflected, and I think we need to be conscious of having a spread of themes in the sessions that are accepted. Um, I personally worked in a very similar way to Sala and grouped things by sort of apples and pears, so it was easy to compare, and I think we can then compare like with like and work on merging to then make sure we have a spread of themes. Thank you. Thank you. I've got um, quite a long queue of speakers here, and I, I really do want to urge us to try and come to an agreement on the proposal before lunch, which is 30 minutes um, with a, a sharp finish at, at the top of the hour. Um, so let me try and put a chair's proposal out and see if we can get sort of acceptance for that. Um, with the assumption being that those, for the moment, let's just say top 60, those proposals that didn't meet the criteria such as the background paper or a report out after the last IGF are marked and set aside and are not at this point part of the assumed accepted 
workshop proposals. I have no idea how many that would reduce the 60 from. Quite a lot, Shangatai says. Um, then, you know, possibly Peter's point is even more important <laughs> about setting hard criteria if, in fact, they're really not being um, assumed by most. So if we said the top 60 and quite a lot comes out, I don't know, that's assumed 20 or side to the side. So that says we have a fairly solid 40 that we could start with as a base. Um, the Secretariat actually prepared a list of the top 30 with the greatest standard deviations, which if you buy that that means there's a great range of we strongly support this or we think this is a particularly bad idea as opposed to perhaps not well written. <laughs> but if you accept that premise, that would seem to be a reasonable group that we might review and see if we want to pull in, pull those into some of the accepted workshop proposals. I think the other category we've heard was those that um, from developing countries are first time proposers, which um, from my own personal perspective are the sort of things I'd like to look at and give a little more attention to and see if there's something we can do to mentor or support those coming up to the standard that the MAG actually thinks is appropriate for workshop proposal. Um, if, you know, failing, so let me just stop there for a moment. Is that a proposal for which we could actually move forward on? And maybe instead of looking for comments, we can look for, if anybody has a, a clarification or think they can phrase a word that better, happy to hear that. And then what I'd like to do is to go for sort of a show of hands from MAG members as to whether they would support that or not. So it looks like Jivan has a clarification or question and Mike has, oh, show of support. So Mike has a worried look on his face, as does Marilyn. So let me take Mike and Marilyn in the queue and then Rasha. Short comments, though, please, so we can move Just, forward. This is a practical question. Are we also going to eliminate those people who submitted a background paper that wasn't really a background paper? I, 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 I would argue we found out that this doesn't work. This was a broken rule. We should have just told people they could submit a background paper and we will give them extra points if they do. But it's very clear this hasn't worked. People have gained the system and we don't have a way to correct for that. So I, I just, I'm curious, as a matter of practicality, would we actually eliminate poor background papers as well? Yeah, I guess that's a key point. If, the, if let's say the top 60, if the top 60 said that we now are ruling out 40 because they didn't really have a background paper or they didn't share a report or they didn't, then I would agree with you, Michael, that that's not, you know, it's not something which was specifically ruled in. I don't know what that number is, though. I, I find it hard to believe that they would get fours and aboves if they had really poor background papers or no background papers from such a wide number of MAG members, though. So I think there's some law of numbers here that I think it certainly helps correct some of that. Okay. Thanks. Um, Chair, thank you for that proposal. Marilyn Cade speaking. Um, I have a uh, perhaps a mild um, suggestion. Uh, let me defer to Peter who made um, a more concrete proposal that would respond to this last question, but I want to address the idea that we need to reward some of those who did the work. So I'm happy with taking the first 60, pulling out those who didn't do reports. People have been told over and over and over, you don't do a, a report, you don't get in. So pull them out. Pull out the ones that didn't do background papers when they said they were going to do uh, a panel. The instructions were clear. I'm going to defer to Peter on whether if you fudge the background paper, we're going to give you a skate on that. I'm not going to comment on that. But I am going to comment on the fact that before we go overboard on uh, moving first-time uh, proposers and developing country proposals up, let's also look at the next 20 or 25 who really did the work and realize we need to reward, and I liked what Peter said, I probably would have used a different word than you did, Peter. I would have used the word integrity about our process. We said we were going to do things. We published criteria. Let's show some integrity about our process. Let's show some humanity as well. Um, but I think if we 
realize that when we pull out the guys and gals who just frankly didn't do it, they didn't put in a background report from last year, and I will just say that in my view, I expected the Secretariat to not put them into the spreadsheet. Um, we're going to make this really short, people. We need to. Rasha, you were in the queue, and then Peter, and then I'm going to try again. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can you hear me? Um, there are lots of good points being raised, and I think it's important to, to keep going back to try to, to how to try to make this a better process next year. And I think, again, one of the important points to keep in mind is that this is all happening because we don't really have a clear process of how are we grading the workshops and so again you know I mean some people probably did take into account the fact that background papers were um, supplied or not and how well they were written but some people clearly didn't as a matter of fact the number the number two the second highest strength um, uh, entry is is a panel with no background paper um, and I understand it's about visibility and uh, diversity and of course that's a buzzword and so we need to keep in mind is it enough for for people just to throw a buzzword that we obviously welcome a session on on that topic but then there's really no information whatsoever in in the proposal other than the two people are proposing to speak about the personal experience that got to be the second high strength workshop so clearly there's something wrong with the evaluation process and we need to take that into consideration for for next year um, I'm not, I'm not sure if we're all speaking the same language when we're, when we're grading workshops, and, and that's the problem. The standard deviation, while I do appreciate the concept, I don't think it's going to make much difference this time around because I'm not really seeing much diversity in the numbers. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's going to help us. Um, uh, and, and again, I, I completely agree that people have sort of steered away from writing that this is a panel, even though it could be, because they don't want to submit a background paper. So should we, be, should we now be penalizing those who did not submit a background paper, but then letting those pass who said, you know, this is a debate when it's really a panel, because they didn't want to do a background paper. So I mean, there are lots of, it's a complicated issue. So if we're going to penalize those with no background papers, and I'm kind of leaning towards that, I think we should also penalize those who submitted an inaccurate format for their panel, and those who submitted a background paper just copying and pasting what they submitted in the proposal. So unfortunately, practically speaking, if we need to do that this afternoon, I'm not sure if the Secretariat has a very tough job to do during lunch, <laughs> uh, but I'm maybe suggesting that we take maybe 40 or 50 percent of, of the highest ranking proposals who did do everything according to the criteria that we have established and then consider a larger margin of maybe 60 to 50 to 60 percent of those who sort of didn't really follow everything through based on what topics we would need to see inclusiveness and diversity of topics and gender and geography and other uh, aspects thank you okay thank you um Chengatai actually just quoted me a figure which I think puts a different spin on this discussion. If I heard him correctly, he said out of the top, it's actually 46 that were four and above, but out of the top 40 or 46, only nine submitted background papers that should have submitted background papers. That's Is that right? I'm just asking for a double check. Mm -hmm. That's what I said. Oh, that should yeah. have. Oh, that oh, should sorry. have. Yeah, yeah. How many should have? Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry, I got it wrong, so. He's, yeah, no, if it's exactly, if it's nine out of 10, that's perhaps not bad, but mm -hmm. Peter, let's make a point. Um, um, Peter, you have the mic, and then really we need to try and agree a way forward. We cannot leave, and we must finish um, uh, sharply at one, um, both for the interpreters and also for another meeting that's going to be held in here. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Peter Dengate Thrush. Just a very quick response to the suggestion that we move to grading the quality of the background papers. I think that's a sophistication for future years. At the moment, our rule is you have to have a paper. And people who have that, or that, so we've got a pretty binary, you either you have or you haven't. Nowhere in the rules does it say you will be fired if your paper is not a good paper. That's a sophistication we can grow to to future years. Thanks. 
Thank you, Peter. Elizabeth, you have the floor. I, I am really uncomfortable with the, um, the way this conversation is oriented itself. And, I, and I, I'm going to go to the subjectivity of words and meaning that we all have and that we choose diversity amongst ourselves in order to balance that in and have the, the, the awareness that we all have different views and perceptions about words. And when, so when in a discussion we're, we're using words like fairness, I always see fairness from you know, that 360 point of view. And I think it's really hard for us to say that it's fair when you cut somebody off at a, at a, at a rule as such, when is the rule in itself fair? Is the um, other aspects of you know deviating around the rule fair? So I I I, I take the point and the and the and, and the perspective, but I I want to go back to what our role is and the work that we've done. As Salas said, we have spent a lot of time and effort evaluating these, and I am very uncomfortable with the idea that we would extract certain ones out. Um, because of certain rules that we might perceive a certain way. And then in, in a face-to-face -face meeting by whoever is willing to speak or not willing to speak, we're going to then reevaluate them. I think that's not a good use of our time. I accept of, and support very strongly the proposal that Avery had made earlier in the day about continuing with the process that all of us evaluated with that sort of perception that we will do this three-tiered process and I and I also recognize the points that other people made about the large number of workshops that we have and the need to look at how we, we might propose mergers or talk about supplementing weaker um, proposals with you know contents and ideas and, and, and cooperation with other um, workshops but um, I, I would say that that it, it's, I, I, I'm exceedingly uncomfortable with this idea of selecting out um, the panel sessions, and, and, I, and I think that there are more people in the room that don't have time to speak, but that would echo that concern. So thank you, Elizabeth. Chengatai just said, well, give, me, give them the uh, oh, yes, figures sorry, you were. Yeah. Okay, so what I get is that we have five proposals who got um, 4.0 and above and our panel and three of them did not submit. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. It's always good to double check, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, it, so let me go back then to the, to the proposal that I actually made. Um, if we assume, again, the top 60, I guess we can ask everybody to look through the top 60 and if you think there's an anomaly or they didn't follow the process appropriately, Let's all agree that by the end of lunchtime, you send that, those figures to the chair, and we can just asterisk those and figure out when we come back and review them. I think what's almost more important is not spending so much time on figuring out which ones we're going to kick out that were highly rated by a very diverse group of people. I would prefer we spend our time on those proposals where we're looking to get a better balance in the entire program and figure out what we do to actually help support the developing country, the first time proposers, and the other areas where we recognize there's not well enough. So I, I'm not saying those that didn't submit a panel would be ruled in or ruled out. I think we at, note them, put them to the side, and then I would suggest we go away and look first at um, if some people want to look at those that are in the standard deviation group and suggest that these are ones that we call out for um, review with the whole mag, they can do that. I'm sure Michael will. Um, I think the other important category, again, is the new proposers in the developing countries. And um, I also agree, and we did this last year, was we determined to look at the next sort of 25, because if you're rated 4 versus 3.98, I mean, it, it's so qualitative what do we think about that next batch of 25? Last year we put a process in place which said we asked people to be a champion for a proposer. So somebody would say in the next batch of 25 or in the first time proposers batch, I think these, this proposal warrants consideration for the MAG and would basically give a, a very short intervention as to why they thought that proposal was worthwhile being a part of the program and we took a reading from the whole MAG. Uh, you know, so that's sort of where I am on on the process here. Can I see if there's support for that or any significant 
Marilyn has a question. Marilyn, you have the floor. Sorry, I just need to clarify. Chiang Tai gave the information that there are only three in the top 46 that should have submitted a background paper that didn't, right? But I didn't hear the answer on how many of them, if any, should have submitted a workshop report and did not. Can we have that fact, please? Follow the chair's um, suggestion. Can we ask um, the secretariat to go away and do that and asterisk those in the same manner they will asterisk those that didn't actually have a background paper? Michael, you have a... This is a question about the workshop reports. Uh, we, we might have to have a double asterisk because in some cases people spoke eight years ago and they didn't, we didn't have a requirement about workshop reports back then. And so when they answered the question, did you submit a workshop report, they said no, didn't know I had to. So it's, uh, we have to watch out for that in case. Chivan. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jivan, you have the floor. There's a lot of green lights that are, that are here. We keep on circling with three people who keep on saying, I mean, I'm sure there's wisdom in this room for other people to say other things, right? Um, I, I think that much of this room actually agrees with what she said. Uh, and I think that we can come in the next 13 minutes to a formula. Uh, and perhaps that formula is uh, cut out the ones without a background paper, uh, put in the 60 with the best marks, work on the next 40 and see if there's something from the other ones that needs to be renegotiated. So let's... Uh, yeah. Thank you. And, and that's, that's why I haven't been following the queue, is I have been trying to, to get the sense of the room and the support on the, the proposal specifically. So apologize um, if that wasn't clear. Um, let me try and close on that now then. Um, so I, the proposal we put forward said, accept the top 60 provisionally, if we want to use those words, because we're going to note those that didn't submit a um, background paper or a report for a panel. For a panel. So we will, we will identify those. Um, and when we come back after lunch, we will have some signal as to whether or not that 60 is you know, now 40 or, or something significantly lower and adjust from there. Um, I think it would be very helpful if, if, and I mean, you said something about diversity, Russia, but that's the beauty in this mag and in all of us being here is that it actually does hopefully reflect a significant piece of the world at large as we actually try and develop this, this internet governance forum. So all those differences of opinions, I think, really enrich the whole rating which is not to take away from the fact that we certainly need to find a better way to, to, to do this. Um, in just one second then. So the other categories I think we really wanted to um, ask people to go away and identify those workshop proposals that they'd like to put in front of the MAG for inclusion in the program. And there were three categories we've come up with so far. That was the top 30 standard deviation group which is in the documents that Chengatai circulated this morning. The other one was first-time proposers or developing country um, proposals specifically. And then there was also a notion that we move to the next 25, so in other words, 61 through 85. Um, certainly the difference between the 85th and the 60th proposal was not an awful lot in terms of the aggregate rating, so it's probably safe to assume that there are some reasonable proposals in there that we should we should pull in. Um, what we had, I can't remember how much we processed this before last year. I thought um, all the specific workshop numbers that people wanted to review in those categories were sent to the secretariat and we worked through them. Um, failing that, and that may be a little bit too much processing given the other things we have going on over lunch. Um, failing that, I think we can probably just say, okay, now we're gonna open up the floor for first time proposers, developing country, individuals, who would like to speak in favor of some of those workshop proposals? Was that clear? Does that work? Is there support for that as a process? Any significant concerns with going forward in that manner? Hassam? 
Yes. Um, well, I think, first of all, uh, whether subjective or not, MAG members did vote, uh, did uh, score, so did rate this. So uh, if we are going to enhance next time, this is good. But already we rated and we had good rating for some proposal, so we should somehow stick to it. Now, this is why. Uh, now, second thing is, which I think is very important, if we could have with those top 60, uh, the potential other proposal that would be merged with, which already all of us put some of it, this will help us in uh, making shorter steps because if you are going to choose other proposals that are already a duplicate of the one on the top 60 list, then we are again doing uh, duplication and not leaving a room for potential new proposals that may come in. So maybe if the Secretary can help us putting uh, the potential um, uh, merge proposal with the top 60, this will eliminate some of what we are going to choose after that. Now another point is, what about the proposal related to um, where there is no, uh, well, first of all, the report thing. I think that the reporting was extremely crucial because this is the way we have the knowledge base. Now, if during the last couple of years, people had uh, submitted a proposal, uh, run their workshop, and did not submit a report, I don't think this is appropriate to carry on with the same uh, uh, for this. So pr proposed uh, paper is something, but report is very important. Not submitting a report is really crucial and should not be included uh, moving forward. Uh, the last point is related to specific workshop submitted with very um, um, non-diversified stakeholder. So either one stakeholder only, or a very specific narrow uh, geographic location only. Uh, are we going to uh, suggest to those proposals to uh, enlarge at least, if they are selected, enlarge their stakeholder diversity and geographic diversity, or are we going to accept it as is? Thank you. Well, to your, to your last point, I would hope that if there was sort of a singular diversity, that it was rated low, and that there are very few instances of that in the top 60 or the top 85. Um, but if, in fact, there are instances of that, then I guess I think they should be encouraged to um, pull in other, um, other diversity. And I think we can maybe make that as an overall statement when we go back to those assumptions. Chengatai did have an answer to one of the questions earlier. Yes, um, to Marilyn's question, um, there are none. Um, for those that have um, not submitted a report, it means that they were first-time proposers, but everybody else has been weeded out. I just want to make a comment on um, mergers. It's always very, very, very difficult to get two parties to merge. I mean, they always say that they are, even if they have exactly the same title with a difference with a full stop and a comma, it's totally different. Uh, that's one thing. And then the other point is that um, how do we do this mergers? Because we have a um, very strong workshop. Let's say it's rated 3.7. And then we have a weak workshop, which is rated you know, 2.7 or, or, or something like that. If they refuse to merge, they both don't get a slot, or does the weaker one not get a slot? But then the stronger one will, will, will always, in most cases, say, no, I don't want to merge. I mean, it's, it's okay if they have the same points as such, and then you can say, okay, that they, they are equal and they have to merge if they want a slot. So, I mean, that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. I think that's been a fairly consistent experience and set of comments over the over the years. Yeah. Hassam, you have. I'm waiting for. Uh, yes, uh, all what I'm saying is I I, I don't have any um, um, problem with the logic that Shankita is highlighting. All what I'm saying is that if we don't know those potential mergers, then we may come and select them in this coming next stage. Now we selected 60. Some of the remaining were potential merger with those 60. If we don't highlight them uh, uh, now, then probably some of us will suggest them again, and then we will have two or three proposals that 
are related to exactly the same topic that we're having different rating. So we need uh, early enough to highlight them ahead so we can keep them aside. Either they emerge or they don't get in the queue. But if there's, if there's um, a strong belief from the MAG members based on past history that mergers just don't work, then suggesting that you merge a lesser rated proposal with one which is higher rated is, is not, it's not solving anything. Um, you know, I would say that the ratings hold. If you've got two proposals that are similar, one's rated high and the other one's rated low, I think the collective wisdom of the MAG chose that one and that we shouldn't have a lot of discussions on which ones we can merge and, and suggest. Yeah, I, I, then we don't, the, uh, if we know this other one, we are not going to suggest it uh, uh, between the 60 and 100. We are going to suggest other proposals. So we need something that highlight for us that some of those proposals already have a more a stronger proposal in the top 60. If, if MAG members actually indicated that two proposals were fairly similar and rated them and were thinking merger, I mean, I think each MAG member needs to look at whether or not that whatever they liked about the lower rated one that they thought should be brought forward, whether or not that's been adequately captured in the other one and make a decision as to whether you bring it forward to this room and suggest a merger with, I think, what is a pretty clear sense of the room that mergers just haven't proven to work. I'm not sure if I'm answering or not. Chief. Siobhan or Liesl? Liesl? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I have um, actually a lot of responses to your questions, Lynn, from, from the prior discussion, but I'll hold those for now and just deal with, with the merger question. I think it's a different thing to think about two workshops that might be similar that could be um, candidates for mergers, but having been in a merger uh, workshop before, willingly um, I think it's it's possible not in every case is it turned down but I think what what we can do is say if there are two workshops one is strong and one is weak and the weak didn't make it past muster by whatever rules we choose to use at this point that what we can do is suggest that some of the speakers or the organizers of the workshop that didn't make it be incorporated into workshops that do make that do make sense for them that kind of speaker engagement is something we need to do after the fact. The second thing I'm going to say, because I now have the mic, is that, um, that um, I want to go back to um, Jack's comment earlier about the number of speakers that were repeated throughout um, the workshop proposals. Uh, uh, and there was no way, really, I mean, that became a subjective judgment about how you graded the diversity in the panels. And the, the, excuse me, the diversity in the workshop proposal. And um, I think another thing we can do after the fact is to take a look at all the accepted proposals, whatever they are at the end, and see if the people that are in three or more panels, whatever number we choose, can deselect themselves and find somebody who is, they can even be from the same organization if it's a new voice, maybe from a different region, to, to replace them on, that pa on whichever panel they choose. Thank you. I think those are good good comments, and we can figure out how we actually mentor and and further improve the agreed proposals. Jivan, I'll give you the last comment, and because we're being told that we need to let the interpreters go, and there is another meeting in the the room here. So, I, when when going into a room that is very messy and a lot of clothes are thrown out, I think it's best to start with the folder, clean that up, and then go to the next one uh, or a drawer. So let's just, uh, I think that if we just have a little system to start things going after the lunch and we start going, the feeling will be that we start checking things off and it will be a different feeling. So I think that let's just start going. Can I have a question about what we're doing? Yeah, no, Based no, on the formulation that we were discussing earlier. Right. No, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I also suspect, um, expect to feel a lot happier about reviewing some of the key proposals and figuring out what we do to actually bring in um, appropriate balances and things. So um, with that, I'm getting some strong signals here from the interpreters that we need to, to stop. Juan, if you have a very short... No, no, after one announcement. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I, 
I don't know if the queue stays here or not, but in this case, I think, um, I don't know if people would have the same comments or not. So I think we'll wipe the queue and we can start over when we come back after lunch.